Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, Sorry for this. I don't know what happened. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, We're here <laughs> we are happy. Okay. Let me then introduce you to the people. Okay. Yes. And yes. Then we will start. Okay. So okay. First of all, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for accepting to to give a talk here. As you know, uh, in IGMAP, we are very active in uh, promoting uh, ERC grants and uh, international relationship. I am sure that your view will be very useful for all these uh, young people that we have today connected with this emerging uh, 2021 school that we have here in Barcelona. So for all the people that uh, is listening to me, let me just uh, make a short a very brief uh, summary of the long scientific and managing life of Rodrigo. Rodrigo uh, Martins is a full professor in material science of the Faculty of Science and Technology of the Nova University in Lisboa, okay, from Portugal. Uh, so he, I would say that uh, when we talk about material science in Portugal, uh, everybody uh, is thinking about uh, Rodrigo and the uh, group around him uh, in, the, in Lisboa, which is very well known around uh, the world and in Europe in particular. Personally, Rodrigo is, uh, has been uh, very active in the promoting the semiconductor uh, materials. And so today you will have, as I mentioned to you bef uh, before, also a talk from Vida Fortunato where you will have a lot of information about what they call paper electronics and how, uh, how they are managing to do low cost electronics. But let me summarize the positions that uh, Rodrigo has been holding around Europe promoting science and uh, uh, science organization. So he has, uh, well, first he's a fellow of the Portuguese Engineering Academy since uh, several years, uh, also from the European Academy of Science. He's a uh, director of the Center of Excellence in Microelectronics and Optoelectronics in, in Lisboa. He has been the president of the European Academy of Science, member of the advisory board of Horizon 2020 in the European Union uh, research and innovation uh, in related to uh, advanced materials. He has been the chair of the European Committee for the European Material Research uh, Society. And uh, he has also been uh, vice chair of energy in the organization Materials Industry for Research Initiative, AMIRI. Okay, so as you can see, uh, he's very active in promoting science organization in Europe. And at present, he is uh, very active in uh, advising the commission in the organization of the RERC and talent attraction and so on. I would not enter into details about the, all the hours and patents and publications that he has made, but I can just tell you that he's uh, uh, very uh, extended uh, CV that he, he has uh, got. So, Rodrigo, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we are very happy to listen to you to your talk. And then okay. we'll have some questions after all. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, Javier, because you cannot see me. Uh, but anyhow, um, uh, the aim of this presentation is more connected with my actual functions as member of the Scientific Council of the European Research Council, which for me is the best scientific council in the world that we, we aim to promote uh, talents. And this is uh, how I will try to, to impact on you, is how uh, ERC is really something else different that uh, acts not only in Europe, but also uh, globally. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to tell you, the European Research Council is an is a initiative that was launched 15 years ago. And the idea was how we could uh, congregate uh, 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 talents in science, uh, exploiting the imagination and with the creative and disruptive ideas that could impact in three key areas, life science. So I, I can give you uh, uh, in first uh, uh, today that we have a new president of European Research Council that uh, is announced today and is Maria Pimpton that he came from EMBO, so from connected to life science and which is also in the origin of um, the European Research Council. And then we have the physical science and the engineering, which is the PE pillar, and then the social science and humanity. So we have three key areas with three vice presidents and uh, one president. So I'm a member and I'm responsible, uh, connected with the, the pillar or the panel E, 
uh, uh, which is to do also with the uh, with the materials, as I will explain later on here. Uh, so uh, uh, the scope of my presentation, and that has been prepared, of course, uh, by ERC, ERC agency, uh, is more connected with advanced materials, which is the 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 target of the school that you are now there. And just forever glancing. Uh, when we go to speak about uh, uh, ERC grants and projects connected with advanced materials that are distributed along all the pillars that I spoke with you, including in life science, I, you can see that um, you have a broad uh, spectrum where you can see materials and the most one is connected with the, the PINAL uh, PE8 which is connected uh, with the engineering and manufacturing. And then also you can see that the, the new launch, the um, projects that uh, uh, is more uh, teamwork with the two to four people, you see that so far in the synergies grants, uh, uh, we have uh, 11 ones materials also connected. But overall, you can see that we have 557 advanced um, uh, grants material related. And the, to the total budget that we have in this uh, last uh, 15 years is, is above 1 billion, 1 billion euros. So you can see that is really, we are speaking in, uh, in uh, figures that really impact on our development. Now, of course, uh, what matters and uh, one of the obligations of the RCs is, is that 50% of the five years of the grant has to be uh, performed and uh, in Europe or connected with an European institution. And you can see here the distributions of the grant so far um, a, a shift. And you found that um, in a very nice uh, fourth position, in, in Europe, you have Spain. Spain is really something else, and is in the, the, in the, in the first quarter. And uh, you see, for instance, if you compare with Portugal, uh, of course, this is not normalized to the population as it should be, but we only got nine. And uh, from this nine uh, ERCs, seven are connected to my, uh, lab to my institution. Anyhow, uh, if you look, because this is what also impacts on the prestige of the, of the, the people, you can see that uh, when you see the distribution by the host institutions, you see that uh, in the first place we have CNRS from France with 37 um, grants uh, received. You see the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the ETH from Zurich with 15, but you can see that the Spanish Research Council CSIC, where you are now, uh, you have 12, 12 uh, projects, 12 running ERC grants. So it means that in fact, Spain is doing well. And of course, CSIC, uh, as uh, Javier said, is a strong uh, prestige uh, also worldwide in this type of activities. And now when we go to look for the, the materials and the, uh, what are the main disciplines where this number of projects, the 557 projects, you can see that you have a very strong number of projects above 180, which is fully materials engineering related. Then of course, uh, you have uh, material science and you have the condensed matter, solid states, and uh, electronics and photonics, nanoscience, physics, chemistry, uh, biomedical, energy, and quantum physics. And when you go to look for the topics of concerning all the panels that we have, uh, that I show you before in my second slide, you can see that uh, the topics are mainly connected for with optoelectronics and photonic systems, semiconductor technologies, nanomaterials, low dimension materials, strongly correlated systems, biomaterials. So you can see that you have a plethora of, of topics where uh, advanced materials are exploited either 
for uh, as a device or a product or a system or a technology that requires this type of advanced materials. Then uh, I, I here I'm presenting you in the the the, the panels, the key pa panels where advanced materials is a key topic. I'm speaking about the condensed matter physics. And you can see on the condensed matter physics, you can see the number of projects uh, advanced materials related that uh, uh, are in this panel, as well as what are the key topics um, of PA3s where materials are, are concerned. You see low dimensional materials, uh, superconductivity, con magnetic, magnetism and condensed matter, transport in condensed matter, phase transition. So you can see that spintronics, you can see that you have a, a strong activity fully related with this. The same for the synthetic chemistry and materials, which is in the panel uh, E5, where you can see again that you have a strong, a strong contribution for material science and organic chemistry um, and uh, as the topics of the of the call of the of the projects that uh, the call is concerned, you see that we have macromolecular polymer chemistry. So it's more if you you want to see uh, organic driven uh, materials uh, synthesis and processing uh, panel for which uh, you can you can of course exploit your 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 no knowledge. Then we have the, the, the panel, which is the core, as I showed you before, which is the panel eight, which is products and processing engineering, where of course you have the, 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 the large number of, of, of projects uh, full uh, related with materials engineering, manufacturing engineering, energy, material science. And of course, then you have a decrease on the other areas. And of course, as the topics we have as a key area, the one that is the present school, functionalized materials, for which you can see also nanomaterials, biomaterials, and manufacturing packaging and thin films technologies. So you can see that, in fact, this is the driving panel as far as advanced functional materials are concerned. Okay. Uh, Indeed, uh, because due to this impact and the relevance of advanced functional materials, uh, uh, the Scientific Council of ERC promote uh, changes, changes in the panels. And uh, for this, we created since uh, 2020, since last year, a new panel that we call PE11, which is materials engineering. And, and this, in, uh, this means that we have to perform some readjustments on the scope of the the the, the uh, whole the panel eight, which was on products and processing engineering, where we try to extract it, the materials engineering component. And of course, this means a full revision of the current descriptors to reflect the changes in science and in the sub submission uh, patterns. So in this, of course, uh, this also accommodated changes on the panel uh, four, that is to do more with the uh, with the interpretations and the philosophy of materials. But the new ERC panel that I'm very proud because I supported it and uh, I advocate for it uh, uh, is focused really on materials uh, engineering, where we have advanced materials development performance, enhancement, modeling, large-scale preparation, modification, tailoring, optimization, novel, and combined use of materials. So in fact, is a, it, it represents how materials are the activators and accelerators of the transformations that we want. And uh, this means that uh, the challenges of the future go through this type of application. So in this case, the material is identified with fine tuning, modification, tailoring, optimization for a specific purpose. How to best prepare it to obtain the best end and use properties, combinations with other materials to improve specific properties. So this means that either on the theoretical point of view or experimental point of view, we are really focused on materials as this type of activator and promoter for the future. Indeed, uh, what we did is uh, we created with this new structure, materials engineering that impacts all the value chain going from design 
to the application and the enhancement of the prototype. So you can see that we have the concept of the synthesis properties uh, modifi uh, modified structural investigation. This type of, of, of things does not include in the, this new panel. They are typical from the panels three, four, and five. If you go for the concept, synthesis, properties modification, and structural investigation. But when you go for uh, materials engineering and uh, trying to improve uh, the, the, the complexity of functions that you can do it, then we are in the panel 11. When we go to the engineering uh, uh, part, which is means the prototype devices, product processes, and the high rank, range uh, scalability, then we are in the panel seven and the panel eight the previous one. So those are the type of ERC grants that goes from the proof of concept grants. And also, uh, we are also uh, aiming to make a very nice bridge with the European Innovation Council. I belong to the work package that make the work group, sorry, that makes the bridge between ERC and EIC. And the idea is, while uh, at uh, ERC we exploit ideas, at EIC we, we aim to implement the idea. So uh, the concept is if you have had uh, ERC grant and if you want to combine your expertise with uh, two or three other colleagues, go for a EIC, a EIC grant. And in this case, of course, the, ratio, the rationale behind the, P, the Pinal 11, uh, the core is materials engineering projects typically uh, that has been submitted at P8. You see, can see here that uh, uh, the, the previous uh, panel uh, eight, which was called uh, products and process engineering, it, within we have materials engineering uh, as one uh, sub, um, uh, sub areas of panel eight. Now, this, this component has been uh, moved and now it was split in two. We have products and processing engineering at the panel eight and materials engineering as a, as a, a lone uh, 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 panel. And you can see here what are the complemented areas that are, are interrelated uh, now and makes the interrelation between panel eight and panel eight, uh, 11 as in the past. You have also something on the condensed matter on physics and analytical chemical science, synthetic uh, chemistry and, uh, and materials, which is a complementary area, systems and commun communication engineering is also interconnected. So in fact, this means that I can promote and I can create it. Here are uh, the typical uh, panels that uh, on materials engineering that we can see. You see that we have the scopes that goes from engineering of biomaterials and bio, uh, mem, uh, biomimetic. You see engineering of metals and alloys, engineering of ceramics and glasses, engineering of, of polymers and plastics, engineering of composite, engineering of carbon materials. So you can see all the categories of materials are really addressed on, by this uh, novel panel that is 14 um, sub areas. So this means that goes from this, the, the design up to the application of the materials of the different type of categories of materials are welcomed at this new panel. Of course, the panel 11 is not a material synthesis. So when, if you have some ideas on material synthesis, you have to go to panel five. It's not a design of new materials. This is a typical uh, topic for panel uh, five. It's not characterization or an analysis of evaluation. This is typical from panel three and panel four, even if it is dealing with materials. And final products design for engineering purposes is kept on panel seven and panel eight. So, Panel uh, 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 11 is just to do with development and, uh, um, and creativity as far as science materials and engineering are concerned. Uh, here, I, I give you an example of uh, when we look for the carbon materials, you can see that when you are looking for the concept of new carbon-based materials, uh, the synthesis, the characterization, the functionalization, and the pilot say, uh, size scale up of the same, they are not from this new panel. They belong to the typical panel five, four, uh, as, as it should be. But when you go 
and you try to see it fine tuning or enhancement of the properties for a specific application, like for LEDs, for la solar cells, then you are inside the panel 11. If you go for a minor chemical modifications, not to promote this, but uh, minor uh, uh, chemical uh, modifications with impact either on engineering, on the material science, then you are in panel 11. If you want to optimize the preparation methods, this is also inside the, the panel 11, but it is not the development of semi-commercial production process is far is, is in the engineering is P8. Development of solar panels, for instance, uh, carbon materials based is on still kept on the panel eight and development, for instance, of what is now uh, impacting our lives, memory resistors, uh, is uh, something that is connected with panel seven mainly. Now, what I would like to tell you is on this 14 years uh, success stories of ERC, we have already given 10,000 top reserves funded uh, projects. Uh, we, we could impact on 67% are at early career stage. So I think in starting grants as it should be. Uh, uh, we have a strong number of nationalities represented as uh, recipients of ERC grants. We got, of course, a high competitive. Uh, we are uh, the rate of success today is, uh, is not 12%, it's 10% because we have um, some constraints uh, when the UK left the European Union. And 50% uh, of the grants uh, uh, in 50 uh, 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 50 institutions, and we have a benchmarking of high quality and talents, as can be taken from uh, the scientific breakthroughs and ma major scientific advances that so far the grants given uh, uh, could be reached, as you can see here on this, uh, this plot. But uh, when we are speaking in talents, we have to say, and this is what I asked the guys from RCA, RCA to prepare to me, is how I can really guarantee that I am promoting talents. This is so someone that got a ERC grant and later on got, got a Nobel Prize, not, not uh, reverse, because if you got a, a, a Nobel Prize automatically by sure, if you apply for a ERC grant, you may get it. But uh, in this 15 years, I, I, I would say that we got already 10 Nobel Prizes that they have been uh, 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 obtain first ERC grants. This is the, the Sir Peter uh, Radcliffe that he got uh, on the, on, in medicine in uh, 2019, the, the, no, the, the Nobel Prize of medicine. And uh, he got an uh, ERC advanced grant in 2008 with a project titled Project Molecular Mechanism of Oxygen Sensing by Enzymes. And this was the topic of um, that he, he got the Nobel Prize, but he was not the only one. We got in the past, uh, also uh, in the recent past, also noticeable uh, guys that got the Nobel Prize. Uh, Bernard Feringa, he got the Nobel Prize in 2016 uh, with, uh, in the chemistry, together with uh, Pierre Sauvage, uh, Fraser Standard, and uh, Feringa, he got um, his first advanced grants in 2008 and the second uh, advanced grant in 2015. Of course, here, Pierre Sauvage also he got um, ERC grant, but after he, he has got the Nobel Prize, so after 2016, so he's not here in my list. Then you have the couple, uh, Moser, that got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2014, and they got, uh, they have been uh, recipients of advanced grants in 2010. Uh, and uh, uh, Edvard got two advanced grants, one in 2008, which was uh, the first edition. Elvira Fortunato uh, was one of the top guys that also got a, a, a ERC grant in this year. And he got a second grant in 2013. But when we go to the economics, you see also the Jean uh, Tiroli got the Nobel Prize in 2014, and he got a ERC grantee in 2009. Uh, 
uh, uh, you have Serge Arroche that uh, on this quantum computing, uh, he got the physics uh, Nobel Prize in 2012, and he got a ERC grant in 2009. And uh, everyone knows Andre Jane and uh, Konstantin no uh, Novoselov, they got the Nobel Prize for graphene. And here, of course, you see uh, Konstantin, he got uh, a starting grant in 2007 before he got the Nobel Prize. And then after this, he got a synergy grant in 2012, uh, like with uh, uh, Andre Gain also got an ERC grant after he received the, the Nobel Prize. So in, uh, besides this ones, we have two other ERC grantees received the Nobel Prize in 2010 and 2012. Uh, and uh, besides this, and ones that I just mentioned, we have seven other ERC grantees who are already Nobel laureates at the moment they received the ERC grant. So in the total, this is, means that really, if I have to prove this is the talents that we are, that we are able to attract with, uh, with the ERC grants. And the two researchers most famous worldwide now are the ones that uh, promote uh, the development of the COVID vaccines, and they have received grants related to the work that, that uh, they have been uh, performing with vaccines. Uh, first one is uh, Adrian Hill. He worked uh, in COVID-19. He got the ARC grant in 2017. Uh, uh, the, uh, related with the, the, the activity that is is performing, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, really uh, used for the reaching the the vaccines that uh, he, he obtained. He was connected with the AstraZeneca as industrial partner, and then we have Yugur Sain. Uh, that uh, from BioNTech, he also received the, the ERC grant, but now the main idea is he used the same formulation, the uh, RNA, mRNA based uh, multan uh, non vaccine. Um, and the idea when he got the ERC grant was mainly for cancer applications, but the principles were the same. And th this is something that impacts on our life. So you can see that uh, uh, ERC is really promoting the talents. Uh, we, uh, and you can see the outcomes of the, these talents are really fantastic. And if you are really have this ambition, and if you want to see more about um, the uh, European Research Council, please, um, uh, these are the, the information that you, 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 you can find and you can make the follow-up of all the activities and uh, what are the dimension and the impacts of the things that we are reaching. So, and this is something that impacts and you can see that this is globally. Anyone in the world, if you are a talent, you can apply to it. So, uh, uh, and this is something very, very, very promising. And I have to tell you that uh, starting from today, we have a new, a new president of the European Research Council, Maria. She came from life science. And this is uh, something that may impact on our lives and can, can really be strategic for uh, your lives. I'm now open for your question. Sorry that you cannot see me. I have to see what's going on with my computer. But anyhow, thank you very much. And uh, thanks also, Javier, to invite me. Uh, maybe we can um, have a drink in next time uh, at Emmy or uh, what, whatever. I also have to say that I'm also very proud to see the, the running president of the International Union of Material Reserve Society. And just uh, four weeks ago, I spoke for uh, an audience of 92 million uh, Chinese delegates that has been discussing the, the commitments for the new King Now plan. And I'm very proud because maybe in my life, I will never sp spoke for so large audience more. But uh, I rather prefer also to speak for small, the beautiful. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to answer to any question. And please make it. OK, thank you very much, Rodrigo. It has been a nice uh, presentation. I want just to uh, 
stress that uh, the number of ERCs that you were mentioning in Spain, the IMAP is actually contributing quite a lot. Uh, and I think we are the leaders on, on the DSIC in the number of ERC. We have got 13 in the whole life. And so we are really completely combined that uh, what you have uh, mentioned that the conclusion that the ERC is correlated with a strong excellence in, in Europe is uh, a, a reality. We didn't know the correlation with the novel prizes uh, that uh, have been obtained, but I think it's also very uh, interesting information. So we have here some uh, uh, hands. Let me see. Uh, Noreen, Noreen uh, can you? You, you will get this. I don't know if you record, but if uh, I, uh, you have available my presentation. Okay, I will. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. It's recorded and it will be in the ICMAP YouTube, YouTube account. And okay. Students and all the researchers from ICMAP can can see it anytime. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hi, can you open Noreen? Noreen? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question related to uh, like for for applying for the grants. Uh, first of all, it was a really nice presentation, and uh, there are so many informations so that uh, I never knew, and uh, it was really encouraging. Uh, my question is like, suppose someone wants to start, uh, someone wants to apply for a grant and uh, is there any kind of um, barrier about like, I am now in Spain after PhD, I don't know where I will be, but uh, I need to, if I apply and it is like 50% inside Europe, uh, but is it like there is any condition that I have to apply from the places I am currently employed or I can apply the grant from for other institution in Europe or from other places as well. You you can apply whatever you are. You can be in India or in China or in uh, Hong Kong, and you can apply for DRC grant. The only commitment that you have to do is it, this is a five years project. Yeah. Fifty percent of the time has to be connected with a European institution. So. Of course, when you, you stay abroad, even if you are not a member of the European Union, if you are in Belarusia or in Russia, you can, you can apply. It's not political barrier, so you can apply. The only condition is that you must have in Europe and in, inside the European Union, a host institution where uh, accepts that minimum 50% uh, of your time is here. Uh, the other uh, uh, constraints that you have as you have uh, three uh, for in this moment uh, typology of uh, of fellowships uh, the starting grants uh, you must have finished your ERC your um, your uh, PhD at least uh, three years before you make the apply the application and you have a, a short window of five years to make this type of application then you have the consolidator that uh, is something between five and eight years uh, when you finish your, your PhD, so uh, is the, the intermediate step uh, that was created because before it was, was only starting grants and advanced grants. And of course, you finish, if you finish, uh, is uh, much longer. So I can give you also the perspectives. Of course, if you have an advanced grant, people expected you to have a very consolidated and solid and solid uh, commitment and experience. So your, your background, your CV has to be determinant. When you are a starting grant, namely, of course, you must have talent. You have to have uh, show that uh, you are able to make things uh, out of the box, as we used to say. You have to be creative. This, so your idea is the most, uh, is the most appreciated, okay? Of course, your career is, is also evaluated. But uh, uh, mainly, uh, this is why I, I gave you this, uh, this uh, slide where you, you could see that 60% of the grants are uh, starting grants because we aim to support young talents. Okay. Thank you so much. For the... Thank you, Rodrigo. I have a question also. So uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really nice and I hope they have clear idea of the ERC now. 
Um, my question is related to, as I, as I told you while we were waiting, they are all PhD students and some of them are in their last year. And I, I want to ask you uh, that you tell them advice on how to develop their career or, and their research uh, in these two or three years that they have now until they can apply to ERC because I, they, they didn't know that ERC they can apply already two years after the PhD. They thought this was something for the top, top, top people. So how, how do you encourage them to, to conduct their research and their, their career development to, to think already for the starting grant, for example? First, first of all, they must be ambitious. If they have no ambition, please don't apply. Second, they must uh, have the virtue to uh, think in something which is high gain and very high risk. Don't, don't make something which is incremental. Don't make something that uh, you are in your lab and uh, it's just make uh, research as usual. No, think in something which is, which is challenging. Either science, whatever you want to, to do, has to be challenging. Um, the other thing they have already a great advantage is the mobility. During the evaluation process, the students, or sorry, the 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 PhD guys that uh, has been involved in mobility programs uh, worldwide, uh, namely in Europe, we have a lot of programs. They, they are, they have people with the broader vi visions and typically this is considered a plus um, in their own curricula. As for instance, of course, um, uh, what happens is that if you have an idea, uh, is no more the the journal that uh, in, impacts on you if you if you if you have a paper published in nature or in science of course this may 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 help but it's not determinant what is determinant is the number of citations how how the people how, how many viewers uh, of your idea how many people believes that your idea may may uh, surplus. So, of course, the evidence is the scientific papers, the, because uh, this is science, how science is made. And I can give you an example. Uh, uh, last October, uh, my group, we published a paper in Optica, and uh, we got 3.5 million viewers. This impacts. So this guy that makes this with me, he, he applied for a ERC grant, and uh, I hope that he may get it. We have another question of uh, Juan Forero. Please uh, go ahead. Juan? Hi, Rodrigo. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, Sorry, so I cannot was... see you. Hi. I cannot hit tapas, tapas with you. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Um, I, had, I had a question maybe rela related with the last thing you mentioned before. Uh, how much is the evaluation procedure based on uh, on your curriculum, as you mentioned, the papers, impact factors, and so on. Because we have on Monday we we listen a talk really regarding this uh, this publish or perish model and uh, saying how much science is affected by it, like how badly it can affect science and scientific production. So how is the ERC actually contributing to or helping mitigating this? This publish publisher page. Yeah, I, I have to tell you that one of the the, the flags that uh, we have in uh, ERC Council is to say that in the last um, uh, fifteen years, the quality of scientific papers uh, uh, coming from the the more than ten thousand talents that um, we we finance more than duplicate. So we have now publications uh, uh, indexes that are uh, slightly above uh, uh, USA, which is a great, great victory for Europe. But we don't, we don't care about, as I told you, uh, when we go to evaluate, we need to know how this will impact. So it's not, uh, we, we, we follow a mixed, uh, uh, mixed feeling between the Florida commitments, you know, where uh, the impact factor of journal does not, uh, is not, we don't prior prioritize the impact factor of the journals. 
we impact, we, we prioritize the, 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 the impact that your paper has on the, the scientific community. Do you understand this? It's completely different. So if you have a paper, if, even if it is uh, published in theme solid films, not in science, but if you get a tremendous number of viewers, uh, this, this, this accounts. And of course, uh, the, the quality, the quality of, of science that you put on your paper, this matters because you have to select five top papers and you have to, to look when you make a, your proposition, you have, you have two things which are uh, uh, evaluate the idea and your position, your ambition, your ideas. And in your position, you have to select it, the five top papers that you, you have uh, and you expect it will create impact. You have to, to mention uh, how you deliver your, 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 your speeches and uh, how much people want to hear you speaking about your ideas, not to make a poster, sorry, but to speak uh, on uh, reliable conferences. And you have to see that you uh, typically the panels, as we have, uh, uh, Javier knows my concept about the metro station that uh, I say that it's like a metro, you have the lines and in the stations you can change the lines. So you have to also to, to account that in the panels you have High, 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 high expertise, guys, in the topic that you are speaking, because typically each each um, proposal is seen by eight, eight in, in average, eight, nine people, from which you have three or four which are highly expert, and the other three or four are people that are broader. They have a broader vision. So you, when you write your 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 um, your proposal, you have to see that you have this type of people. It's not just you cannot uh, uh, make a di dialogue with a high expertise guy. You have to communicate the way how you communicate information that a, br a broad community is able to understand what you are saying. Then you are on the track. Okay, don't go for very much details because. Uh, they, uh, the community that we'll see it is very, 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 uh, very short. You have to speak for a broader community with a broader sci scientific community with a broader gain, uh, 10, uh, 20 times uh, the present state of the art. Don't, so look more for the quality of uh, the science that you have in the paper not uh, too much for the impact factor of the journal where you will publish. Okay, thank you, Rodrigo. So I think we should stop here. Your concepts have been very useful. I'm sure that everybody appreciated, but we should proceed with the next speaker. So okay. thank you very thank much you, again. Yeah. And thank hope you. to see you bye bye. very bye bye. soon. Thank you very much. Okay. It was bye a pleasure bye. to stay with you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So. Bye. Now we have Monica Bello, that she's around. Sorry, Monica, we had issues with the connection and we started a, a bit late, pretty late. So, uh, well, guys, uh, we have here Monica Bello. Uh, I invited her because uh, I think sometimes uh, you researchers are focusing a lot in, in research and don't think that you are also, you have a creativity side on you because uh, while you are conducting your research, you are doing creativity. You have to think of new ideas. And, and I, th I think that sometimes we forget about the artistic side of, this, of science, that it's not as, that far as, as you think, no? So Monica Bello is a Spanish curator and art historian. For example, she was uh, the curator of the quantum exhibition that was in CCCB in Barcelona. I, I guess most of you visited the exhibition. For more than 15 years, she has been curating exhibitions and events internationally in collaboration with leading artists, designers, researchers, and scientists. And since 2015, she is the curator and the head of Arts at CERN at the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, that I'm sure you already, you already know it, and I, I guess some of you may, may have been there. And there she curates the research-led artistic residencies 
and new art commissions that reflect conversations and interactions between artists and particle physicists. Before she was in Geneva, she held the position of artistic director of VIDA at Fundación Telefónica in Madrid, a pioneering award that fostered cross-cultural expressions around the notion of life. In 2018, she invited the inspirator of the Audemars Piguet Art Commission for Art Basel in 2018. In her curatorial work, she discusses the way artists uh, instigate new conversations and, uh, around uh, emergent culture and societal phenomena, such as the role of science, and that's why she's here, and technology in the perception of reality. Welcome, Monica. Hello, Laura and everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And um, it's, it's, um, it's a privilege to be with you and um, within a scientific environment. So I'm hoping to, uh, to bring you uh, to my wall, uh, which is um, uh, in the intersection of art and science and uh, in a very special environment, which is CERN, the largest uh, laboratory in Europe. And, um, and a huge community of scientists um, uh, and engineers, many of which might be here in the uh, sharing this panel with us, or uh, yeah, being part or associated to the research uh, that uh, my colleague scientists do at uh, CERN. So uh, before I start, Laura, I should ask, how long do I have? Thirty minutes? Yeah, thirty minutes. Uh, so originally, uh, yeah. I already told the next speaker that we are late due to the okay. <laughs> so you still have 30 minutes. It's better if you are like 20, 25, and then we leave for some questions, five, 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. I, I'll, I'll, I'll make it uh, briefer than, than originally planned, I think, because the questions are important. So let me, let me share these uh, slides with you because I think for me, it's very important always to describe, uh, well, the places that you, many of you uh, might know, but also the, the faces, uh, the actions, the experience. So I'll start uh, the slides, slideshow. Okay. Um, so um, I'm the head of arts at CERN, and this is the arts program of the laboratory, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics in Geneva. And uh, our goal, the goal of the arts program of the lab is to support artistic practice in relation to physics and fundamental research. Uh, artists from all over the world are invited uh, into Monica, we still see the cover of the of the presentation. I th it's not in presentation mode, so I don't know if you want to because then we have full screen if you put it now. now ah, we okay, okay. Hang on. So I need to do something. Uh, let me let me let me just do it this way because I need to go to my notes. And uh, is that okay for you? Sure, no problem. That's okay, okay, uh, that's that's better for me. So I I I don't waste time in my thirty minutes because I thought it was a, a frozen because it has happened already that the ah okay <laughs> okay no no it's my fault but uh, let's do it this way and I uh, move the slides okay uh, yeah so the uh, sun is the uh, is the home of the large hadron collider which is just one and the, the largest of the accelerators the, of a huge complex of accelerators that. Uh, tells so much about the history of science in the recent years, in the last 60, um, 50, 60 years in Europe. Um, this is a very special place to bring artists, but uh, we found in 10 years ago that uh, we already had many artists that, uh, reaching us uh, to, to come to the laboratory. And um, at some point in 2011, a fellow from the Clum Foundation in London, uh, a curator, uh, approached the directorship of uh, CERN saying, hey, I, I want to do a pilot project uh, at the lab because uh, it's a great environment for uh, artistic and creative inquiry. So our director at that moment, 
uh, Rolf Hoyer say yes, and uh, we are here 10 years later. Our program has um, developed in many directions, but our core program, our core goal uh, still continues being a place, a platform to encourage and foster dialogue between artists and scientists and engineers. So art and science are pillars in our society, are um, something that we are good at. Uh, so this platform uh, was really a, a structure to, to, to respond to the uh, demand, the cultural demand of uh, understanding what science is doing. What are the questions? What are the big mysteries and the big discoveries that uh, scientists are trying to uh, achieve? Uh, and artists uh, were, of course, part of this uh, conversation. So there is a societal uh, level in the work we do that is very important. Bringing science into society is something we do uh, um, and, I, uh, and we've been really aware of this, raising awareness about science and, uh, a, 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 and its big role in society. So during the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, I will share some insights of how CERN engages with art to later continuing uh, to, to show you the work of the next artist in residency, uh, a collective from Philadelphia called Black Quantum Futurism, uh, who explore questions about uh, the physical world and the reality described, especially by theoretical physics, but uh, we will discover them the world of high energy physics during the residency. And later, um, I will use some of my time to uh, conclude with questions, challenges, and, and commonalities of why art and science are together and closer today and, um, and uh, as we are seeing in cultural institutions, in the news, and uh, so the, the, these rhetorics about art and science, why is that? So um, this is an, an aerial view of CERN. CERN was funded in 1954 the, uh, as the uh, Council for Nuclear Research, the European Council of Nuclear Research, uh, which is now uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research or Particle Physics. Uh, the, the, the same mission continue is um, uh, everyone here uh, works to understand the uh, fundamental structure of uh, matter and how this makes everything what um, uh, from the origin to the to the future there are cosmology is part of the, the research as well and as well as uh, many other disciplines so uh, from experimental physics to engineering engineering theoretical physics it there are many fields at CERN and we are a large community of around 14,000 people so it's a really vibrant and dynamic um, and uh, multicultural environment and reaching exchange and uh, very fertile and exciting. So is, um, uh, as you might know, the particle accelerators are the main uh, engineering, the main experiments at CERN. Uh, they accelerate clumps of particles in beams uh, around mostly circular cubes to close to the speed of light. At certain points, beams traveling in opposite directions will collide at high energies and the, date, the data uh, of the collisions produced uh, in these processes provides clues of what occurs at the most fundamental structure of uh, matter. So here is an example of um, uh, some of the uh, most beautiful and uh, amazing experiments we have, the CMS detector at the Large Hadron Glider uh, in, the, in the tunnel underground, uh, around uh, 80 meters underground. Uh, so as I said before, theoretical and experimental physicists, engineers, and IT experts, as well as the staff, which I'm part of, uh, work side by side to open up new inquiries, new physics, as well as to respond to established models and predictions with experimental evidences. 
um, this is a regular view of the, the, the theoretical department in which uh, what you see outline our programs, but I, I, I find it really interesting this picture in which the artists are with uh, our colleague uh, Daniel Figueroa, cosmologist, which is now actually in Valencia, but at that time he was at CERN and he was introducing the artist to the yeah, the basic notions of cosmology, uh, contemporary cosmology today. So there are many questions in physics uh, that have been, are being pursued by the scientists at CERN, uh, you name it, uh, dark matter research, extra dimensions, why antimatter has disappeared, dark energy and gravity, uh, um, standard model, uh, the, what is new there, well, the new physics that is being pursued, as well as high energy at, at many levels, engineering and making uh, better detectors and accelerators for the future. So it's a really exciting, exciting moment in physics, but um, on the contrary, society knows very little. And, uh, and I think this is always in our mind when we work with the artists and there is so much to express and communicate to them and exchange with them as well as understanding their own perspectives. This is what we do. Fabiola Gianotti, our uh, uh, director general, uh, stated in Davos, in the conference in Davos in 2018, that um, she is very much in favor of a diverse and multidisciplinary culture uh, we have to break cultural silos, she said. When people talk about humanities in one side and science, art, um, uh, science and art in other, like if they were incompatible and mutually exclusive, they are wrong. Uh, they are uh, art and science, the highest expressions of creativity, ingenuity, curiosity, and, uh, and curiosity of humanity. So I think is, this quote is really key for us. This is why we do it. Um, as I said before, the artist uh, did not start to come to CERN, have not started to come into CERN because we created a program. They were already there. In fact, uh, this uh, person that you are seeing in the CERN site, in the Meran site, is James Lee Byers. He's an artist from the 70s. Uh, he was uh, on performance art, very experimental, very uh, conceptual in many ways. And this picture was taken in 1973 and he came back again in the following summer, in 1974. Um, I was born around that time and uh, I've been running this program for 10 years. So compare, <laughs> it's a really interesting um, uh, uh, story. Is But it's not an anecdotic. Uh, this happened in the 70s when CERN was running still uh, nuclear research. There were artists coming to understand or to try to have the feeling, the experience of science, this, this science, scientific sites that were uh, really um, speeding up technological development. So, uh, and uh, later we had closer to our time in 2005, uh, Gianni Motti, an artist from Geneva, walking through the tunnel, uh, a tunnel uh, uh, which uh, hosts now the Large Hadron Collider, but at the time it was empty because there was a transition moment between the lab and the Large Hadron Collider. And he walked through the tunnel 27 kilometers uh, to, to um, embrace the idea of what a particle collision it might be. So this research he, he made, uh, he called it a la recherche uh, del antimoti. So in a kind of mimicking way of uh, a particle going through this tunnel. So before our time in 2011, when the cultural policy of some artists were already welcome to the lab. 
Um, so uh, today uh, we have many artists like Maria Nudecker. We have around uh, 25 artists in our formal and official program every year. And uh, they are welcome to the lab as part of this strategy to open science to society and to invite creators not to communicate science. We don't want scientific communicators. We have a team and we have an area to do that, but to explore the challenges of imagining a multifaceted world. And this is something that science describes very well, but um, not in the same language that artists do. So there is something about communicating in different languages, different voices, uh, which really um, features what society is today, I think. So most artists who, vis uh, who visit uh, us will never have experienced anything like it. Entering the lab immediately becomes clear that is not going to be a straightforward experience. It's not easy to comprehend the broad range of experiments, their scale, their function, the theoretical models as uh, we saw before, and also how to combine both expertise. I, I mean, see these pictures, I, I, I think it's, it's quite vast, the possibilities, even computing, uh, yeah, what kind of information artists want to collect from the lab is something important for us. Artists right now, they can uh, participate with us as uh, artistic residences, as well as art commissions and uh, later exhibitions like uh, the exhibition Quantica that you might have visited in, at uh, the CCCB uh, in 2019. Uh, and, uh, and we promote, we, we listen to them, we take care of the process, we combine uh, their expertise with the scientists' expertise, we curate the dialogues, there is a huge program in which they go and see and, and find collaborators, and uh, we, uh, we take each artist's experience as individual, there is no standard for us. So this is what I do. I'm the curator of, uh, of the program. So we take care, we cure these experiences. Um, artists can be uh, attracted by the experiments, which are overwhelming often. <laughs> it's super exciting to think about antimatter and to understand how these technologies work or the data, data driven minds, uh, how this data is being processed, is being is becoming tangible, is giving us information about certain ages in our universe or, but many artists are captivated by the theoretical work. The, the theory department is very busy with artists. So I'm going to uh, talk about this artist, Black Quantum Futurism, which happen to be right now in Philadelphia, but they will come to Barcelona as well as to Geneva, because uh, something I should mention is that we run programs uh, as part of uh, national in Switzerland and France and international collaborations. And right now, Barcelona is uh, one of our main partners in, in, in our program called Collide. So Black Quantum Futurism apply for, uh, uh, for the residency, the residency Collide, and, and they will have the opportunity to come to spend two months at CERN, and then they will come to Barcelona to uh, work with scientists. So if you are, in, any of you are interested to work with them, please uh, send me an email or a message and I'll be happy to, to, to make the link because these people um, are really interesting. They are, they are really original uh, creators and they will uh, be seeking support and collaboration with scientists. So uh, Kamaya Jewa and Rashida Phillips are also known as Black Quantum Futurism. They are two multidisciplinary artists based in Philadelphia. 
And during 2021 and 22, they will complete this residency combined, uh, combining uh, both cities. Their project is called uh, uh, the project that they was uh, selected by a board, a jury, to, to complete the, this residency is called CPT symmetry and violations. If there is any physicist in the room, uh, they will know that uh, CPT symmetry uh, is uh, an important uh, topic in physics. And they express their project in, in this way. They intend to explore the notion and the experience of time and its interpretations and research in physics. So it's about time. In their own words, the project seeks to understand the way that physics can influence how people think about experience and measure time in everyday reality, exploring the possibilities that in a specific quantum physics offers beyond the limitations of traditional linear notions of time. In their work, they propose to consider space and time in other ways, such as through the lens of the hidden temporalities present at the Black African diaspora, and how this way of experiencing reality can take place and create other possible future scenarios. Um, this is part of uh, a research that they have been running for years around time and how this affects individuality as well as collective experience of reality. And they uh, find that um, Black Afro diaspora temporalities and the traditions of time might share parallels with quantum principles uh, in their uh, poetic. Uh, way of putting it, they say that the past intermingles with the present, interwoven with the futures, time is alive, dynamic and texture, past and futures variables can be held in superposition, existing in the infinity states of possibility, open to influence, collapse into reality and, and collapse back into superposition at will. Um, the configuration of time and space in relation uh, have informed their work for years and is of crucial importance for them to create context of critical thinking and to raise awareness of different temporalities. How they do this? They, they create installations, community workshops, they write books, they make uh, music, and the most important thing for them is to create a collective uh, um, uh, engage uh, participation. So it's a true engagement by listening to people, by understanding other knowledges that are familiar to them, and by understanding uh, the social uh, codes, of the challenges, and uh, as you see in the screen, they use CPT, symmetry, which um, and they pick these studies that respond to time as time as charge, parity, and time reversal as the fundamental symmetry of physical laws that holds for all physical phenomena. So they, they'll be in Barcelona uh, for a while, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, if the pandemic allows. And uh, as I said, uh, you are welcome to reach us and to, uh, I'll be very happy to, to, to make some sort of engagement with them. These are some views of their work, which I will not spend much uh, uh, longer uh, explaining, but uh, the, there will be a conversation in Geneva and Barcelona around this work. And as I said, they will go through a residency with these statements and under the direction of Arts at CERN and the team in Barcelona, they will connect with scientists, engineers and staff to learn more about their investigations of time in physics and to exchange with them perspectives that originate at the social and cultural realms. So I'm going to jump quickly in some questions about art and science. 
which for me are really important if we are considering to bring the artist in a laboratory environment. Because since 2015, when I embarked in this very inspirational cultural project, I'm an art historian and I'm a curator. I have a specific knowledge in art, science and technology and society. So I, I'm, I, I was not new to this kind of uh, technology, sciences and languages. But um, since uh, since my time at the beginning, since 2015, I keep asking myself why, why artists, historians, cultural workers are so keen to cross the limits of disciplines and to spend time developing these relations. So for me, the question uh, could be um, uh, break down in some others, and I'm going to expose this to you and perhaps for reflection and debate later. So um, one uh, question is that um, we live in an unprecedented moment when we have so much knowledge, uh, we know uh, uh, so much of our nature or even our universe, our technologies, and therefore our eyes reach as far as and as deep into outer space, uh, crossing the boundaries of our galaxy or inside matter to a point in which a fragment of a hair can, can, cannot longer be divided, becoming, uh, we can see at the fundamental level as far as our technology allows. So we even know, uh, we even know right now uh, how to describe uh, some unknowns. So dark matter is a good example of these uh, things that we know we don't know. Uh, so we seek to understand uh, what is there uh, that makes knowledge and what can we do with this knowledge. This is what art and science do. What is this knowledge about? So uh, with art and science, uh, uh, both disciplines operate in very specialized environments. And in my opinion, I'm convinced that behind the impulse to look uh, for uh, alliances between these disciplines, we are also trying to obtain and regain the social space that has been lost. Uh, this specific art, and art in general, if we want to go as far as there, and science are uh, not understood entirely by society. Uh, so we need, in a way, be to be together to regain this social space. Um, what else do we have in common? We have the will and the ability to imagine. This has not been exclusive. Creativity has not been exclusive to the art. On the contrary, science has also been compelled to imagine, to design, and to structure new and unknown worlds. Furthermore, highly advanced technologies have allowed us to construct new things, new models, to uh, obtain precise information of what have been uh, until recently blind spots in our understanding. So this, this uh, ability to imagine is very important. And then um, finally, art and science are by nature disciplines based on attention, rapid response to phenomena, observation and alertness. And uh, most importantly, uh, especially in this moment of our history, responsibility and care to the object of investigation, but also to, to what comes after that. Is the act of doing art and science implies the act of uh, seeking uh, well-being and even um, uh, a juster uh, world. So for me, uh, these are big questions that we try to bring into our program and artists and scientists together explore. And uh, from these dialogues emerge, something happens. And, um, and they are, uh, in my opinion, in, in the core in the, in, in, of their activities, um, um, link, connected, they, they look at complex reality and they need, they, they, art and science 
uh, look for ambitious, inspiring, catalyzing ideas for a better present and an even better future. So I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to stop my presentation, which was pretty brief. And I can, I can answer some questions if there are any. Very inspiring talk. <laughs> I hope uh, the researchers have now a different idea of, of art and to see that it's not that far from them. So we have a question from Artur Romano. So Artur, when you want. Yes. Uh, okay, thanks, Monica. Uh, I think you showed very, very beautiful pictures uh, of the CERN site. Um, and it's, it's also a very, very interesting topic in all in all, because um, we know that science pushes more and more into society nowadays. And in fact, um, science is also dependent on uh, public funding. Uh, so in my opinion, art can be a nice way to um, increase acceptance of, um, of science in, in the society. Um, and, and do you think that um, this trend of um, finding the art and science will increase in the future. So do you think that, for example, in 10 years, um, ICMAP or other um, science institutions will also have an art department? Or what do you think, how could we uh, increase the interface between science and art? Um, <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I hope so. Uh, I think well, I've been I've been working my entire career in this, and it's really exciting to see that uh, many new people are coming, and uh, and and we start to talk about physics and biology and sciences of complexity and computing and you name it um, uh, inside the museums and cultural institutions, but also outside, uh, you see that in the news. Even so, science is very present. Science is a pillar of our society. We see na nature through the eyes of science. So, uh, if you ask someone to describe uh, a phenomenon, I don't know, the, 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 the light spectrum, what do they see? Is something that probably was, uh, came out of a lab. It's, it's not coming from a communication of science. I, I, I don't think it is. But in the coming years, we will see more diversity in this description of nature, thanks to these connections between science and culture. And I think, I think it's crucial for us to understand that uh, the interpretations are open, but always based on, yeah, responsibility and precision. So it's something that I really learned from spending my six years in the lab and uh, from early jobs is that we, we need to go deeper into our inquiry. But without these conversations, you will be always working on the ideas that were yeah, created uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So it's very important to open the laboratories to uh, very, very uh, reliable and uh, professional people like artists. And I hope other laborator laboratories that do that because I cannot do it on my own. Uh, is <laughs> frankly, the demand is huge from the scientists as well. And some other people are more skeptical, but I think there is a demand and we need to take this as an opportunity. Mm. Well, we have a question from Juan, but because my question was related to this, I wanted to ask you how uh, prone to collaborate with the artists, the researchers are, because I think sometimes it's very difficult because they are in, in, the, in the laboratory and they have a lot of work. Mm. How it's kind of forced, no? To to you have this artist that is coming here and you start a collaboration. Are they willing to do this, or they feel kind of stressed because of the situation of doing this now, this artistic? Because I think it's something very interesting. As you said, it's very important to do this collaboration to open the science to the society. It's a way to analyze 
this, uh, this uh, the way to society. So how prone to do this are the researchers at, at them? Uh, well, this is a, um, a very relevant question in the terms of uh, how to manage something like this. So it's, a, it's about a, yeah, it's about a cultural management in a way. Uh, I think uh, I think you need to create culture uh, that uh, um, if you go to uh, someone who is not familiar to our work, the work of the artist, they will think in often in terms of, uh, so there is something I need to do. There is an outcome, a quick outcome. But um, um, I, think, I think with art you, and with science as well, you, you, uh, you need to go back to this uh, blue sky thinking or this uh, approach of let's dream, let's dream. It's an opportunity to stop as well and to think of the synergies in your job that you are not practicing enough. And I'm talking about art and science uh, because artists are often thinking of the delivery. So research and exploration and giving the right to the artists to be researchers is very important. And then when they are endorsed as researchers, they are equals. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the, the uh, my position is very privileged in the sense that we have 14,000 uh, people at, working at CERN. And uh, you, you will not fail in finding someone who is interested, but in a smaller labs, you, I guess you need to nurture a community. Monica, we will try to do this here. Let's see. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, we, we were talking with you that maybe a uh, black quantum futurism, they can come to ICMAP uh, when they come to Barcelona. So, uh, so guys, if you want to start a collaboration with them, they will come to ICMAP and tell me and we can speak with Monica and we can maybe create something. I think it would be very nice to, to start this artist, artistic side of, of ICMAP as well. Yeah, so, uh, Laura, Laura, let's not think about collaboration. I, I, I think spending time with an hour, an hour seminar is like, hey, listen to each other. This is okay already. We, because the collaboration is the delivery, the outcome it can yeah. emerge. It can, it, it can, it can happen, or maybe it does yeah. not happen. Yes, yes. I will let you know, guys, uh, when we when we will have this visit, and you can see them and talk to them, and they, let's say we can do a seminar or something, and they can do a tour, and let's see, let's see. So we have another question from Juan, and it will be the last because we are a bit late. So Juan, please, when you want to. Yeah, mine, mine is also a bit of a follow-up of yours, Laura. And it's, uh, um, if you have any testimonies from scientists who have done also these collaborations and these conversations with artists, it's like how, like maybe none of us know how, how does it feel to, to, to actually speak or, or try to, communicate in, in that way because it's it's a different way of communication. So do you have any stories or any testimonies? <laughs> we have a very good Instagram uh, page uh, where we uh, show some of the testimonies. Uh, uh, which is interesting is that um, most of them uh, agree on that uh, by bringing artists into the lab and spending time with them, this see their discipline with the eyes of others. So they see the synergy, they stop and think, and there, there is a moment in which, yeah, when you are not talking with your, your colleagues, uh, you, you have to transform your language or your language is transformed by the act of doing. So I, I think this happened and uh, this, is our, this is what the, the response of our artists, uh, our scientists, but there are many experiences. We have 25 artists per year. None of them are uh, working on the same topic or they will see many different experiments, people from different backgrounds, senior scientists, as well as postdocs. This is very interesting. They don't think the same. <laughs> they are very different <laughs> and uh, so uh, I think I think we like to avoid standards and and to listen to to listen to the experience 
Of course, when we need to do the report, we have the quotes, uh, everything ready, but the outcomes and the engagement with the public, uh, think that Quantica was the third exhibition uh, most visited in the history of the CCCB. So um, what's about quantum physics? Is is there is there is a hunger to to, to understand science in society, and we do it through through the earth. So there is something going on there that we really need to pick up and respond. Thank you, Monica, and thank you to all. I hope uh, we have motivated you. <laughs> <laughs> I am looking forward to, to, to see how Black Quantum Futurism uh, works and how it is done and let's see if they can come to IGMA because when I told you when I got to you, I contacted Monica because I knew from this Art Center project because I'm a fan of Moore Model, that is one of the <laughs> guests of uh, Black Quantum Futurism. So let's see if uh, they can come here and they can enjoy ICMAP and the research that we do here as well. And thank you, Monica. It, has, it is a pleasure for me to have you here. Oh, I, thank you. Thank you. It's, 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 my, it's my pleasure as well. I think uh, going into a different lab and yeah, it's super exciting for me. <laughs> so I hope to see you soon next time in person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, Bye. One with Rosa that will present the next speaker. We are you are muted, Rosa. Yeah. Hello. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Alejandro Franco. He was uh, uh, head of the modeling group of the electrochemical uh, systems at uh, the CA Grenoble for a while, and then he moved to, to Amiens, and now he's full professor at the Laboratory of Reactivity and Chemistry of Solids. And he's also the leader of the uh, theory open platform within the Ali Story RI, which is a virtual research institute devoted to, to battery research. He has received uh, awards like the High Level Research Laureate in, in France, and also the National Award for Pedagogy and Innovation uh, in 2019, because as you will see in a minute, he's a very, very good communicator. And uh, you can have a hint of this if you look at the Twitter uh, or um, profile for his ERC project. And also he, he organizes a series of very successful virtual seminars in the framework of, of this ERC. So Alejandro, the screen is yours and happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa, for the very kind introduction and for the invitation so, to this great event. So it's very interesting. So I attend the presentation of Monica. Very, very exciting. So I will share my screen and uh, let's see if it works. So do you see my screen? Great. Perfect. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> Laura, fine, right? Yes. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about batteries and uh, digitalization of the manufacturing process of these batteries. And I'm going to try to explain why this is uh, important. I mean, to, to help in the energetic transition that we are experiencing right now, right? So, um, First of all, I, I, I will talk about lithium ion batteries. I think um, well, all of you, you know lithium ion batteries because they are powering mobile devices, they are powering the laptops and maybe you are using uh, today to, to attend this, uh, this uh, great event. And not following the emergence of the electric vehicles, right? And a lithium ion battery is so operating. So when you have a discharge process, when you discharge the battery, you have lithium ions moving from a negative electrode to a positive one. And then when you recharge these batteries, it's simply the opposite, right? So lithium ion moves from the positive electrode to the negative one. And as you know, so we always want better batteries, right? Batteries that they have higher autonomy, you know, higher durability, higher safety, and so on and so forth, right? And in the community, so in scientific community, there is a lot of research in order to improve. Uh, current lithium ion batteries, right? To improve their autonomy, safety, and so on. And we should note that all these practical properties of batteries, they're related to the, the way that we make them, right? To the manufacturing process of these batteries. 
And making a battery is like cooking, you know, preparing a cake, right? You have different steps, you have different recipes, you have different ingredients, right? That you need to put in the right way in order to make a, a battery that performs well, right? When you take a look on the manufacturing process of a lithium ion battery, so you start by preparing the, what we call the slurry, which is actually a suspension of particles in a solvent, in a liquid that can be organic or aqueous, right? You mix these ingredients, right? For a given time, a few hours. Then, so what you will do is you will cast this slurry on a metallic foil that will be the current collector of your one of your electrodes in your lithium ion battery cell. Then you will dry this casting in an oven, right? In order to evaporate the liquid, right? The solvent. And then you will get your electro, right? This negative electro or positive electro, right? That you have in your lithium ion battery cell. In order to improve the electronic conductivity of this uh, layer, so through the improvement of the contact between the particles which are present inside this, uh, this electrode, you need to apply a pressure on the electrode. So you are going to press the, the electrode. So during a, a lunar process called a calendaring process, okay? And then so at the end, you will get an electrode that will become thinner with better electronic contact, better conductivity than the one you had before, right? Af just after the drying. Then you will do the same with the other electrode, right? This, this is for the positive electrode, you will do the same for the negative one. You will put a membrane, a separator in the middle between the two electrodes, and then you will perform what we call the winding process, which is simply, if you are talking about making a cylindrical cell, so it's just uh, doing a roll, right? With these materials, exactly as with a cake, right? And at the end, so you get your cylindrical cell, right? That is here. And then the next step will be to fill the cell with a liquid electrolyte. And the role of this liquid electrolyte is ensuring a proper exchange of lithium ions between the negative electrode and the positive electrode, as I explained in the previous slide, right? So at the end, you close the cell, you get your battery, right? And the practical properties of the battery, such as the energy density, that means the amount of energy you can store bomb weight in your battery, the power density, which is related to rechargeability speed of the battery, and strongly related to the electrode structural properties. The electrode structural properties here refer to the way that the different particles that are present in the electrode are organized in the space. And basically, in a lithium ion battery electrode, so you have three types of materials that are mixed. You have the active material, which is the particle which is going to host the lithium ions during the operation of the electrode. You have carbon particles. The role is improving the electronic contact between the particles. And then you have a polymer, the binder, whose role is to stick these particles all together mechanically, right? But also you need in these electrodes a porosity. You need pores in order to fill them with the liquid electrolyte, right? In practice, in industry and in academic labs, we use a lot of try and error. So a lot of empirical approaches to optimize all these different ingredients and different steps along the manufacturing process. And obviously this is very time consuming and it's very expensive, right? Because you spend a lot of time to find the right parameters to make the right battery, right? Then, so what we need in the community is uh, predictive models or so mathematical models that are able to predict how the manufacturing parameters are going to impact the electrostructure and the associate characteristics of these electrodes, right? In terms of energy density, safety, and so on and so forth. More particularly, so what we need is digital twins, okay? And then the question is, what is a digital twin? A digital twin is simply a copy in the computer of a real system, right? In this case, so what we are intending to do here is uh, developing a digital twin of the manufacturing process of a lithium-ion battery cell. Therefore, we're talking about a copy in the computer of the actual, of the real manufacturing process of lithium-ion battery cells. How we can do that? We can adopt two different types of approaches. We can do what we model, physical models, or we can adopt machine learning models, okay? So what is a physical model? A physical model is a mathematical model describing so the physical interactions between these different particles that we are mixing, that we are you know, casting, drying, and so on, okay, along the manufacturing process. And uh, these physical models, they can be based on different geometrical assumptions, okay? If we use, for example, an empirical model, an empirical physical model, in this case, you are going, for example, to predict 
So through a very simple mathematical equation, how, for example, the, the, the amount of active material you put in the electrode is going to impact the porosity of your electrode, right? Well, if you use a 3D model, so you are going to describe the physical interactions in three dimensions, right? An empirical model is going to be, computationally speaking, very cheap. I mean, you will be able to run this equation in question of seconds to make predictions, but the prediction capabilities of this empirical model will be very low because these models are fully based on experimental data, right? You need to do first experiment to extract the parameters that you need to fit in this equation and to make the prediction. Why? If you use a 3D model, so you are going to have a very precise description of the real system in three dimensions, and if this model is experimentally validated, it will be very powerful in terms of prediction capabilities. However, it will be very time consuming in terms of uh, simulation cost, right? Because you will, these models are very complicated to solve, right? In the other hand, so machine learning, so refers to a collection of models that are able to learn from data, right? And these models that are able to learn from data and make predictions, right? In very short uh, computational cost, a very, very small computational cost, if they are properly trained, because these models usually they need some training phase, as you will see a bit later. And the training phase usually is very, computationally speaking, very costly, right? Very time consuming because you need a lot of data and you need a lot of training in these models. As you can see, so physical models and machine learning models, they are complementary, right? Both of them, they have pros and cons, right? And in the next, so I'm going to show you some, some examples of how we can use these uh, tools, physics-based models and machine learning models to develop digital twins of each step along the manufacturing process of lithium-ion battery electrons, right? The first step is the electroslurry. The electroslurry a suspension of particles, like I say actimaterial, carbon additive, depending on the type of actimaterial you use. You mix this, right? And the question is how we can model this based on a physics-based model, right? So a way that we can model this system is the following, so this is the slurry, right? If you take a look in the, in the size of the different particles that we're mixing here, so you will find very quickly that we have a very low, large uh, discrepancy because actimaterial particles, they have a, a typical size of the order of micrometer, while carbon black has a typical size of the order of 10 nanometers, let's say. A binder, a polymer monomer, has a typical length of two nanometers, and then all this is su suspended in a, in a liquid, right? In the solvent. If we intend to do here a simulation based on molecular dynamics, where you are going to simulate the interaction between molecules and atoms in the system, this will take a while in terms of computational cost because it's a very expensive system. You have to deal with millions of atoms, right? To deal uh, with the system. Instead of doing so, so here we adopt an approach that is called coarse grain molecular dynamics. I'm going to space. So basically we represent this slurry as a collection of two type of particles actual in gray and carbon binder domain in, in red here. Okay, so uh, this particle contains carbon binder and solvent, right? You know, every time you are doing a model, so you need to do an approximation of reality. All models are wrong, right? For sure. But that can be very useful, right? And models are convenient, right? Depending on the objective or what you want to do with your model, you will define this approximation of reality to make the computations feasible, right? Then, so at the end, you get this collection of particles that we represent as slurry as a mixture between actimaterial and carbon binding domain. And in this technique called coarse grain molecular dynamics, you will resolve the interaction forces between these different particles. Okay. And these forces here that I'm going to describe in a second, they're going actually to allow us to calculate the acceleration of the particles using Newton equations. That all of you, you know, right? Newton is very classical, classical using classical mechanics, right? And then by integrating one time in time, you can get the speed, and two times in time, you can get the position of these particles, right, in the space. So then, so this kind of simulation starts in the following way. So we place in a in a box, uh, we randomly distribute active material particles, represent here in red, and carbon binding domain particles, represent in green, which contain carbon binder and solvent. We apply so then Newton equations, we solve them by using forces, interaction forces, that we call them in, in the field force fields, right? Doesn't matter here the exact mathematical representation of the forces, but 
was in, in, important to understand that these, these forces are going to describe attraction and repulsion between these different particles that are present in the slurry. We run, so this molecular dynamic simulation, so we solve the Newton equations, these with the, all the different particles, and then we reach at the end, so I equilibrate the computer, the slurry, okay? This is really the digital twin of the slurry, okay? Of the electro slurry in, in the computer. This digital twin of the slurry, so can be characterized in terms of density and viscosity in the computer. And then, so you can intend to, to fit these calculated numbers in the computer with the ones that you can, you can estimate at the experimental level, right? And then you can get very nice fitting. So if you get very nice fitting, so you are happy with the model, right? And the model is enough to describe what is going on at the experimental level. Here you have the viscosity as function of the applied shear rate, which is kind of the formation that we are applying in the slurry upon the coating of the slurry on the current collector in the first step of the manufacturing as function of the composition of the slurry. So this is the weight percentage between active material, carbon and binder. And as function of the solid content, the solid fraction that you have in your slurry, right? Thanks to this fitting procedure, then you can determine the parameters that you need to put in these force field expressions in order to simulate the slurry in a proper way. The next step of the manufacturing is the coating and the drying, right? So you cast your slurry in the current collector, you enter the slurry in the oven, then you will dry the solvent, right? You will evaporate the solvent. And then you will get your electron, right? To model this, so we start, we can start with a slurry digital twin, right? And then, so what we do is we shrink the size of the CBD, these carbon binding domain particles here that are represented here in green, to mimic the fact that the solvent is escaping, right? The solvent is being evaporated. These green particles now they are represent a yellow when the solvent escapes, right? And we, we took out the, the solvent from the CBD particles. And then we run again, so molecular dynamics, and we solve these Newton equations to predict the trajectory of all these particles in the volume, right? By again, so accounting for the interaction forces between these particles, which is what we call the force fields, right? So by doing so, you will reach a new equilibrium state. And this new equilibrium state will be the dry electrostructure, where you can very nicely visualize where the active material particles are going to be located in space and where the carbon binding domain particles are going to be located in space. Right? You will see later in my presentation that the spatial location of these particles is going to determine the practical properties of this electro when it's going to be used in a practical lithium ion battery cell, as also as I explained at the very beginning. Right? So you can, of course, in this model, play with experimental parameters, such as, for example, the drying rate, okay? So it means the speed of evaporation of this solvent. And if you apply, so a drying rate, which is very significant, so you dry too quick, you know, this uh, electro, this slurry, you will get at the end, so heterogeneous electrostructures. I mean, electrostructures where the material distribution along the thickness of the electrode will be heterogeneous, right? So you will be a gradient of, uh, quantity of amount of carbon binder, for example, along this electro thickness. And this is something that is very important, I mean, to control well the drying rate, right, which is associated to the temperature that we're applying in the oven and the speed of the coating. It's very important to control these parameters because then you will get, at the end, so electrodes that will be heterogeneous or homogeneous, right? And if you get, for example, heterogeneous electrodes, you may, you may fail you may face some troubles in terms of aging, you know, of your lithium ion battery cell, right? And in terms of practical usage of your cell in a mobile phone, you will need to change your mobile phone, your mobile phone more regularly, right? In case that you cannot demount the cell from the mobile phone, right? You can also approach this problem of slurries, coating and drying using machine learning, right? As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, so machine learning is um, actually a collection of, of mathematical models, sophisticated mathematical models that are, that are able to learn from data, okay? And then making predictions when, once these models are trained, sufficiently trained, right? So machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence, right? This is why some people, uh, sometimes they, they, they used to talk about um, artificial intelligence instead of machine learning. And so we can find the machine learning applications in, in many fields, right? Originally, so machine learning models, they can be used to develop uh, smart games, uh, to play chess, for example, to play a Go game that is considered to be the, the most difficult game uh, invented by humans, right? 
but also they are widely used for, for example, spam filtering in emails, but also for face recognition in Facebook, right? Or for autonomous driving or for recommending movies in Netflix, right? So machine learning is around us already. And you have in your mobile phones a lot of machine learning boost apps, right? Machine learning in this in battery science, as in any science where you have to deal with big data, so it's very useful because thanks to machine learning models, you can really discover correlations between uh, parameters, numerous parameters that you can have in, in your experimental data sets. In particular, when you are doing manufacturing of these lithium ion battery electrodes, you will deal with many inputs because in this recipe, you need to consider many parameters, right? And you will deal with many outputs, right? You will characterize the property of the electrode in many ways, right? In terms of porosity, thickness, loading of acting material, and so on and so forth, or mechanical properties, exactly as you are doing with a cake, right? When you prepare a cake, you will for sure taste the cake, but also you will take a, a look in the thickness of the cake, in the texture of the cake, and so on and so forth, right? Then it's very complicated to deal with these uh, data sets based on empirical approaches, right? Machine learning can be very powerful to establish correlation between output and inputs, right? In your experimental data sets. And how machine learning works? Basically, you start by collecting data. Then you take a subset of this data, right? That we call it here, training data set, which is a collection of input and outputs that you already experimentally measure. Then you will train your machine learning model, right? That will become better and better to reproduce the outputs already given as function of the inputs you are giving to this, to this model. Once this AI or machine learning model is trained, so then it can receive a, a new subset of data that is called the validation data set, okay? That will help you to define the accuracy of your trained AI or your trained machine learning model to make predictions, right? So if with this new data set, so this, um, train AI is able to give a correct answer of output given a given input, then it will have a higher score, right? It will have high accuracy as a tool. Otherwise, it will have a low accuracy or a low score, right? Once you characterize the accuracy of your model, right? If the accuracy is sufficiently high, right? Let's say 90%, that means that in 90% of cases, this machine learning model is, is able to give the right answer given a, a given input. Then you will use this model to take a totally new data set, right? That you didn't characterize yet in terms of output at the experimental level to make predictions, okay? And the predictions, they can be performed in two different ways as classification. You can, for example, classify how battery processing parameters, uh, manufacturing parameters are going to impact the quality of your electrons or your battery cells. Or you can perform regression predictions that are quantified predictions, such as the impact of, for example, the calendaring pressure that you are using the calendaring step on the electroporosity, right? This is quantified. You have also another category of machine learning models called unsupervised machine learning models that they have the power to take raw data and then make automatic labeling of this data or automatic classification, right? And for this kind of models, you don't need to predefine what are the input and outputs. The model is able to recognize automatically what are the input and outputs, and it's also able to automatically classify this data. And then you will find classes that you can use later on in your supervised AI to make predictions, right? For example, regression. So machine learning models, there are many techniques available, right? I don't have time today to describe um, more, more much more of them, but I will just describe two of them just to give you a flavor and to help you understanding that machine learning is highly inspired from nature, right? One typical machine learning model is uh, the so-called, or machine learning technique is the so-called artificial neural networks. I think everybody has seen, uh, heard at least one about artificial neural networks, right? An artificial neural network is simply a mathematical function linking an output with an input or linking a collection of outputs with a collection of inputs. That's it. And this mathematical function construction is made as the link between different mathematical operations representing neurons in human brain or in animal brain. This is the thing I would like that you keep in mind for today. An artificial neural network is simply a mathematical function linking multiple inputs with multiple outputs, right? Through elementary mathematical representations of the operation of a neuron, you know, in a human brain or an animal brain. Another technique is the, this one called reinforcement learning, okay? 
And here you see the video of this chicken. So when these chickens choose the right color, you know, this disc, which is pink, people, they give food to it, right? They feed it. And then, so next time that the chicken needs to solve the problem and find the right color disc in pink color, it will most likely choose the right answer, right? It will select the pink one because it was fed before, right? This is an example of reinforcement learning that happens in nature. And there are also machine learning techniques that they do exactly the same. When they give the right answer, they, they will give them a reward, right? You have different ways of doing machine learning by yourself. I mean, there are many uh, programming languages available, uh, like Python is the most popular one. And you have some libraries such as TensorFlow or Keras that allow you to do machine learning models. And also you can use some scientific uh, programming uh, programs like uh, MATLAB, right? You can also do machine learning there or R that is very well used in, in the context of data statistics. You can also use cloud services to perform machine learning. I mean, you can create an account in, for example, in Google Cloud, and you can buy time for doing machine learning models in the cloud, right? To address your scientific problems. Now, if we come back in the context now of battery manufacturing, so we can use machine learning to predict how, for example, slurry properties, they are going to impact the loading and the porosity of the electrodes after drying, right? And here, so what we have demonstrated that it was possible to create a machine learning model with accuracies above 80% to predict more precisely a slurry formulation. That means the amount of active material carbon and binary you have in the slurry, solid content in the slurry and viscosity on the loading and porosity, right? And here I'm just show you one example of the kind of result that you can get with this model. So you can get with this machine learning model, you can get graph like this that are two dimensional that can be very useful for guiding engineers to design the, I mean, to decide which manufacturing parameters adopt in order to make an electro with the desired property. Here in particular, you see different graphs corresponding to different formulations, different amounts of active material in your slurry. The y-axis represents the solid content of your slurry and the x-axis the viscosity, right? Here, what you can see, and the color represent low porosity, medium porosity, or high porosity electrodes, right? There are three classes of electrodes with three types of porosities, right? So what you see here is that very quickly, you can decide which formulation you need to adopt and which viscosity and solid content you need to adopt if you want to make, for example, an electro with low porosity, right? Because then you should see where is located this Y zone, right? Of course, if you know you want to interpret the results, you really need to go to the physics model side, right? Because that is a take home message here is machine learning model is not going to give you any interpretation of why the result is like that, right? Why the prediction is like that. You will need in order to interpret the results for machine learning to do complementary experiments or to do run a run of physics based models like the one I showed you before to interpret what is going on here. In particular here, you see that for low amount of active material, you see that machine learning predicts that it's impossible to make electrodes with low porosity. While if we increase the content of active material in slurry, it becomes possible to make electrodes with low porosity because this white zone appears. And this is something that can be explained in the following way. So when you have a few amount of active material and then you have a lot of carbon and binder, when you do the casting process and you pass the slurry through the coma gap, so the slurry is going to expand, and when you will evaporate the solvent, these active material particles, uh, there's a lot of uh, carbon binding in the middle, they will not uh, become too close to each other, right? And then you will have a system that will have medium and high porosity, but no way to have low porosity that here means uh, something below 30%, right? While if you um, increase the amount of active material, then you have less carbon and binder, then when you evaporate the solvent, as you have less links between the active material particles, these active material particles become closer to each other, and then you can reach situations where you will have electrodes with low porosity if you choose the right viscosity and the low, the right solid content. Right? And if you take a look in the raw data, okay, you see there is a totally a mess, and it's very difficult to, to say something about this kind of graph, right? And the beauty of machine learning is that you can transform these multidimensional data sets that are very difficult to interpret just with the eye in something that is understandable, interpretable, and readable, right, by a researcher, right? Like a bidimensional graph like this that looks very much like a phase diagram, you know, in material science, right? The next step is the calendaring process. The calendaring, as I mentioned, so it's important to improve the electronic contact between the particles that you have in your electrode. 
And in order to do so, you will use a calendaring machine, which is actually a press, right? But it's very important to improve the electronic contact between particles, but it's also very important to avoid collapsing the pores, which are inside the electrode, because otherwise, for the electrolyte that you need to, to fill there, it will be very difficult to go in, right? So this graph here is just experimental data showing the complexity of this uh, process. Uh, basically, the porosity of an electrode strongly depends on the calendar in pressure that you apply, and also strongly depends on the formulation or the solid content of the star you use. And also the pore size distribution that you have in your electrode, of course, will be also strongly dependent on the formulation and the degree of calendar in your, in your electrode, right? It's a very complicated problem. And definitely to address this problem, both machine learning and physics-based models, they can reveal very useful, right? Here you see uh, an example of physics-based model. Uh, this is based on a technique called discrete element method, which is actually a kind of molecular dynamics, as the one I showed you before, describing the mechanical interaction between active material particles in blue and carbon binding domain in red, right? Thanks to this model, so you can basically um, fit uh, curves uh, obtained using microindentation characterization that is actually a mechanical characterization of the electrodes that is very useful to extract, for example, yeah, modulus and hardness of the electrode. But also you can very nicely reproduce a compaction curves extract from experiments. And a compaction curve is simply a curve representing the porosity of the electrode as function of the applied pressure upon calendar, right? Once you do this fitting, you can really trust in your model because you say, okay, this model can reproduce two types of experiments in the right way. And then you can visualize in nicely in 3D how these materials are organized in the space. This is something that is very difficult to do at the experimental level, except if you do tomography, right? Tomography characterization in 3D, which is not uh, high throughput, right? Because, you know, uh, um, booking time for a beam line to do tomography and so on, it takes time, right? While here you have a computational tool that is able to predict morphology of electrons in 3D as function of the manufacturing process. Once you get these electrostructures ca calculated from the calendar and simulation, you can characterize them, I mean, using a process called boxerization, okay, to extract properties such as, for example, the tortosity factor. The tortosity is basically, if you take a, a porous media like this and you want to go from the point A to the point B, the tortosity is the ratio between the travel distance and the straight line distance between A and B, right? And this is a very important parameter because this will determine the power density of your electron, right? the speed of recharging your electro will in part depend on this parameter. What you see here is the tortosity along the set direction, which is the thickness of this electro, depends on the calendar in pressure, right? More you apply pressure in your electron to improve the electronic contact between the particles, higher will be the tortosity factor, and most likely slower will be the speed of rechargeability of your electro, right? Because you have a higher tortosity. Right? You see, there is really a trade-off to find here, and this is why physics-based models can be very useful to do so. But also machine learning models can be very useful to do so. You can collect experimental data, I mean, related to the calendaring process. Uh, for example, you can collect data about the influence of active material content, initial porosity of the electrode before calendaring, initial thickness of the electrode before calendaring, the calendaring pressure, on the porosity you get after calendaring. You can build a mathematical function that then you can use to in a stochastic generator of electrostructures in 3D, which is actually a model uh, placing randomly particles in a volume, in this case, pores, carbon binder domain, and active materials. You can characterize these structures in terms of all the properties you want, like uh, the tortosity of the pores or the percentage of contact between active material and electrolyte, which is supposed here to fully fill the pores. And if you do so, so you can train a machine learning model Okay, and this machine learning model will be able to predict how the calendaring parameters are going to impact the electro properties, this time as a quantification, right? As a regression, as we say in the machine learning field. And here I'm showing you an example. So this is the predictions for machine learning on the influence of calendaring pressure on the tortosity of your electrode as function of the initial porosity of the electrode before calendaring and as function of the formulation of your electrode, the amount of active material you have in your electrode. Each color here corresponds to a different content of active, a different formulation, a different electrode with different amount of active material. You see that when the pressure is being increased upon calendaring, so the tortosity of the electrode generally increases, right? As expected. 
However, you see that the magnitude of this increase strongly depends on the initial velocity before, of the electron before the calendaring, and also strongly depends on the formulation of your electron. And you see, once again, these kind of maps, they can be very useful for engineering because very quickly, you can take a look on this kind of graph and decide which uh, pressure you need to apply in your calendaring process in order to reach an electron with the desired tortuosity, right? And then the desired power density. Another beauty of machine learning is that you can build this kind of correlation maps here between the different variables that you can play at the experimental level. For example, you can very nicely investigate how the calendaring pressure impacts the calendaring pressure impacts tortuosity and other parameters. Red circle means that you have invert correlation, and green means that you have direct correlation. And the size of the circle is the magnitude of the correlation. If you increase the calendaring pressure, so machine learning predicts that you decrease the porosity. The circle here is red, and the impact is quite high, right? Because the size of the circle is big. If you increase the calendaring pressure, you are going to increase the tortosity because the, size, the color of the circle is green, and the size is quite big. So then machine learning predicts that there is quite a strong correlation between these two variables. However, when you increase calendaring pressure, you see that the percentage of contact of carbon binder domain and current collector is increasing a little bit, but not too much. There is a weak correlation here. And thanks to this map then, so an engineer and a technician very quickly can decide which parameter he or she needs to minimize or maximize to make an electron with the desired properties, right? Once again, this example shows the power of machine learning to organize the data, big data, in a visual way, right? You can go a step further. Thanks to machine learning, you can here predict things like uh, the influence of the calendar in machine parameters on the volumetric capacity, which is related to autonomy of your electrode in the battery cell, in a very graphical way. Here you see the influence of the applied pressure and the roll temperature I use for pressing the electrode on the volumetric capacity that you get. And this is kind of heat map is very useful once again for designing your battery, right? Because very quickly, thanks to this program, you can decide which calendar parameters you need to put in your machine in order to maximize the volumetric capacity of your electron, right? You can do the same with electronic conductivity or other property that you are interested on. The next step is electrolyte infiltration. Okay, and electrolyte infiltration is injecting the electrolyte in the porous media, right? And to model this, I mean, using uh, physics-based models, so you can use a technique called lattice Boltzmann method, which is derived from classical fluid dynamics, right? So it's simply describing the fluid uh, propagation in a porous media. And here, so what you see from these simulations is an blender electrode works very well, the electrolyzing right here, why the calendar electrode takes longer time to be wet, right? If I play again the video, you see this. And this is simply because once again, the calendar electrode has higher tortosity, right? So then for the liquid, it's high, more difficult to go and to wet the full volume of the pores, right? It takes longer time than in the case that you have an calendar electrode where the porosity is higher and where the tortosity factor is lower, right? A consequence of that, that if that you have slower wetting of the calendar electrode, so with electrolyte, is that you will have some zones, some volume of the pores that will be occupied at the end of this wetting process with air, okay? Because at the beginning of your pore selector, you have air. And this is very bad because if you have air in the pores, then you may have here some zones of the active material that is supposed to receive lithium ions or release lithium ions, this zone will not work properly, right? And then, then you will lose uh, capacity, you will lose autonomy for your electron, and you will eventually also lose power density, right? The speed of recharge will be slower, right? Because of this phenomena. Then it's very important to understand this, and this is what we did here. So we developed a digital twin of this wettability process in order to predict how well is going on this uh, wetting process, right? When you put the electrolyte in the electrodes, right? The wettability strongly depends on the electro architecture, for sure, as we, as we study today. It also depends on the contact angle between the electrolyte and the electrode, and also depends on the electrolyte properties, such as the density and the viscosity of the electrolyte. And then this strongly depends on the chemistry of your electrolyte. And you should know that in the lithium ion battery cell context, there are plenty of electrolytes that are possible, right? I mean, in terms of chemistries. I mean, people are doing a lot of stuff using, including ionic liquids, right? I mean, just to go to some kind of extreme cases here. So you can also use machine learning to predict electrolyte filling in three dimensions. And this is a, a work that we have performed very recently. So in this case, uh, what you do will do is you take the results from the lattice Boltzmann simulation. 
you will basically um, measure at each pore in your electrode volume coming from tomography in this case, the saturation curves, which are actually the curves describing the volume of liquid that you have per unit of volume of time. And then thanks to this data, you will be the neural network, okay? And this neural network will be able to receive any kind of electrostructure to predict very well, so the filling process of the oil electrode, right? The saturation curve of your electrode, depending on the pressure you apply for the filling process and so on and so forth. Real, the dashed line corresponds to the uh, what a lattice Boltzmann method simulation will give as a result. And prediction is the machine learning prediction. The advantage of using machine learning is that computational cost is much lower than what you can have using lattice Boltzmann method. Lattice Boltzmann method will take several days to simulate electrolyte weighting in an given electrode, while machine learning just costs a few seconds, right? Once it's properly trained, as I explained at the very beginning, right? And here you see in this video, so the prediction of the weighting coming from Lattice Boltzmann method compared to the one that you get from machine learning in 3D. I play again the video. And you see that the model is able to predict in 3D how the electrolyte weighting is happening in the electrostructure, in complicated electrostructures in question of few seconds, right? Because this data-driven approach is based on machine learning, right? And this definitely pays the way to kind of a computational screening of this uh, electrolyte infiltration process to find the optimal conditions to improve the wettability of electrons depending on the wettability conditions and the type of electrolyte that you use. The last part of my presentation is the electrochemistry, right? Once you get this digital twin of the manufacturing process, then you can wonder how this will operate in real life, right? To do so, so what you do is you incorporate the electrostructures coming from the simulation of manufacturing process in a software able to resolve all the physics going on in an electrode which is powering a lithium ion battery cell, right? Here we use in particular console multiphysics, this, which is a software that I really recommend you because it has a very nice uh, user interface, right? User flame interface. And in this software, you can plug all the equations that you want, right? Describing uh, the different processes going on in the electrodes, such as the lithium transport in the electrolyte or the battery volume equation that is typically used in electrochemistry to, to relate the potential and the current, you know, in electrochemical systems, and also the electronic conductivity of the different materials that you have in your electrode. Thanks to this performance simulator, then you can get a digital twin of the electrochemical behavior of the electrode in 3D. And here you see in these videos, so the behavior of the impedance, electronic and ionic impedance of this uh, predicted electrodes from the manufacturing simulations. And you see that these impedance are highly heterogeneous, right? So, and this is because the carbon binder domain, which is the inactive phase, the inactive material we have in these electrodes is heterogeneously distributed in the electrode volume. And this definitely is going to have also an impact in terms of aging, okay, of the lithium ion battery cell. This model is also able to, of course, predict observables, things that can be characterized at experimental level, such as electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, which is a technique widely used in the electrochemistry field, telling us things about conductivity of electrons and so on and so forth. Okay. Next step is the modeling of the behavior of the electrode, right? Once you get the impedance in 3D, you can also, of course, simulate the discharge or the charge process of your lithium ion battery electrode. In this case, uh, NMC is a nickel manganese cobalt based electrode. And you can uh, investigate the influence of the calendaring process on the capacity, which is related to the autonomy you know, of these electrodes. And basically here, what we found is that more you increase the calendaring pressure, so more the porosity is lower, then better electronic contact between the particles, higher will be the capacity because your electrode is behaving more homogeneously. When you take a look, a look in the litiation process at the end of this charge, you see that this uh, more compact electrode is the more calendaring one, is basically more, lithium is more homogeneous, right? Because you have more proper electronic conductivity of the composite and lithium diffusivity between the active material particles, right? These things I, I show you today, I will conclude with, and, and before moving to the final remarks with this slide. So uh, I show you for lithium ion battery cells, right? But as I explained at the beginning, so making a lithium ion battery electro is like cooking, right? If you are working in other fields of material science and you are preparing coatings, right, for, I don't know, photovoltaics or whatever application you want, you will face the same kind of problems. You will need to deal with a lot of data, a multidimensional uh, data set, right, with many inputs, many outputs. 
And then here, so what I try to convey as message today is that physics-based models can be very useful to provide interpretation, right, of this uh, manufacturing process. And also machine learning models can be very useful to unravel correlation between these different parameters that you need to deal at experimental level. And to show you this, that this methodology can be extended to other technologies, here I show um, with one slide uh, an, an example of very nice collaboration we have with uh, Professor Shirley Meng, that, who spoke, uh, I think, yesterday in this event. And um, here, so we apply the same machinery, machine learning models uh, machinery, to uh, predict the optimal manufacturing conditions that you need to adopt in order to make uh, solid state uh, electrolytes with uh, high uniformity and high conductivity. My final remarks of this today's lecture. So what I show you today is a digital twin or a collection of digital twins of the manufacturing process of lithium ion battery cell electrodes more properly. We I show you things related to physics-based models and also data-driven models or machine learning models that are the two pillars of this digital twin, right? Um, this uh, digital twin can be used uh, using uh, computers, right? I'm going to show you in the next slide how you can use this from an internet browser in, in a second. And also you can use innovative human machine interfaces. I'm, I'm going to conclude with that. And this digital twin is aiming to perform a better analysis of how manufacturing parameters influence uh, materials properties, and also to predict the influence of manufacturing parameters on these material properties and also optimize them, right? And all this work is performed in the context of the artistic project that was mentioned by Rosa at the beginning. So you can use some of these models from by yourself for free using an internet browser, simply by connecting to the web page of the project artistic, okay? When you will connect to this project website, so you will be able to create a login, right? You will receive an automatically a, a password. And then with this password, you will be able to enter in free online services that the project is right, right now give, providing to the community. You will be able to, for example, navigate uh, the databases that we are producing the project coming from physics-based simulations or machine learning models. But also you, are, you will be able since the uh, 5th of July, I mean one week, to run the manufacturing simulations using the physics-based models from internet browser. You will be able to simulate the slurry, the coating, the drying, and the calendaring, right? And you will be able also to download results for sure. So you will be able to download these three-dimensional electrostructures, right? And then you can use for interpretation of your experiments or optimize your experiments and so on and so forth, okay? This all for free, right? Using the high-performance computing facilities that we have in our, in our university. It's a free service for the community. Last uh, thing is the following. So we are also very, very much, uh, you know, concerned about education, right? About this um, manufacturing process, electrodes, and, you know, battery technologies and so on and so forth. And since uh, six years, we are developing virtual reality serious games. Uh, I see Juan here, Juan played with one of these games, in, I think back in 2016, in the context of the MESC uh, Erasmus uh, Master, uh, with the first generation of this game, it was the very, very first one. Since there, so we developed uh, a batch of uh, seven games, right? Seven serious games. And uh, you see here, there is one that allows st students to, um, to fly through electrostructures to uh, characterize the tortosity of the electrodes, right? Just by simply flying through electrostructures. You have another one here that is a upgraded version of the one that Juan used uh, back in 2016. That actually is, uh, you have to drive an electric car, car power with a battery cell, right? Lithium ion battery, lithium sulfur, lithium air. You can choose your terminology. Uh, by escaping from police cars and um, by collecting three presents that are randomly distributed in a virtual city, right? This is just two examples among the seven serious games that we have developed since uh, 2016. And this is the last thing I'm going to show you today is a, a radically new concept that we are working very hard and that we present in a webinar series we organized in the context of artistic last week. That is a concept based on holograms, uh, in particular using HoloLens 2 technology, which allows superposing digital information in the place of experimentation, in the place where you are manufacturing your, your lithium ion battery cells. In this case, you see a video taken in our lithium ion battery prototyping unit. And what you see in the room is a series of holograms representing actually panels and parameters that you can, you can enter. Uh, it's actually like an online notebook, right? Instead of taking notes of your experimental parameters in a, in a notepad or in an Excel file, you will do it, do it in real time in the place of experimentation through these holograms, right? 
And we believe this is very nice because thanks to this, you can imagine using these artistic models to make predictions in the place of experimentation, in particular, thanks to the use of machine learning, because some of these panels, in particular for the calendar process, I'm not showing here because of time reasons, you can request to this notebook to make a prediction on the fly of how the calendar machine parameters are going to impact the electroporosity and electrotontosity. Well, thank you very much to everybody for, for the kind attention and uh, well to Rosa and Igma for the for the kind invitation and I will be very happy to well to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for such a, an awesome, awesome and, and an amazing presentation. It's like uh, being transported into the future. I presume there are <laughs> questions you, from Rosa. students. Uh, I can I cannot see any raised hands. Don't be shy. It's Juan. Ah, Juan. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, Alejandro. Uh, Hi, Juan. Very nice, nice to see you. Very nice <laughs> to hear you as usual. Um, it was very very nice. Uh, very very interesting. I would I had like two questions. The first one is very easy. Uh, how transferable is the, the models? Like you said, the, the, in the website, you will have some kind of server that, you allow, that would allow you to calculate all these parameters affecting battery fabrication. So how transferable is that to other, like to a new material that you're starting in the lab? Like if you synthesize a new uh, compound, how, yes. how does mm -hmm. that change? Very, very nice question, Juan. Thank, thank you very much. So definitely uh, here, the, the models are well parameterized for NMC with, um, well, as, uh, you are working in the battery field or you used to work there. So you know what is NMC is. NMC is a, a reference acting material for positive electrodes or lithium ion battery cells. So in the platform online, so you can change the particle size distribution, for example, right? And um, this, you can, you can use this as an input of the model to predict the electromorphology as function of the manufacturing parameters that also you can modify in the platform, depending on how you are doing your experiment in your site, right? Uh, drying temperature, time for the drying process, calendar pressure, you know, formulation, solid content, all these parameters you can play with that with a specific chemistry in MC. So this is the first step. Uh, this is why we are releasing this year, right? For one single active material to allow people to discover these tools and to play with them we are using friendly uh, graphical interface, right? Because we intend these tools to be useful for experimentalists, right? But all in the project, so we are also working in other materials, uh, in particular graphite electrodes. I didn't show today this, um, silicon graphite also, that is a, now a hot topic, you know, in the lithium ion battery cell community. And also we are working in LCO for positive electrodes, NCA, LFP, right? So we are intending to generalize these tools for this, uh, wide batch of chemistry, the most used chemistries. We are actually, we are demonstrating that this methodology is highly transferable, right? To these other chemistries. And this is why we are confident that uh, by next year, so we'll be able now to release more, more chemistries. And by 2023, by the end of the project, all these chemistries I, I was mentioning just before, right? Okay, okay, good. Uh, the other one, well, the other one was a little bit more, uh, into how much is the, the, the validation done of your machine learning um, models? How much is done, how much of that is done to, with, with experimental data? Because mm -hmm. particularly when you're talking about the filling process, you use the Postman method yes. to, to feed the machine learning. So in that sense, I don't see such a surprise that the machine comes out with, with an output because it's like we know there's there's a an equation behind, but how much is the, the experimental part of it really see, messing around? Yeah, I see your point. Uh, so for for this electrolytic so it was trained using uh, results coming from a field. It was like that because it's very difficult to characterize at experimental level how the electrolytes uh, infiltrates electrodes. Right? It's very difficult to to uh, collect experimental data to visualize how the electrolyte is going to penetrate the electro. Probably kind of tomography, you know, operando tomography could be the way to do so, but this is still under development. So, I mean, it's, they're, they're, as far as I know, there are no efforts in this direction, right? I mean, people is trying things, but it's very difficult. 
this is why we use data coming from a physics-based model. And this is why this physics-based model is uh, useful, right? To vis try to visualize what people observe microscopically, right? Because this, they observe good wettability or poor wettability. But here we explain why, thanks to the physics-based model. Now, regarding the, the part of experimental data, in that case, no, there is no part. I mean, the, the, the degree of wettability will be a kind of experimental input there to validate the lattice Boltzmann simulations, right? But for the other topics that I addressed today, such as uh, calendaring or the coating drying and so on, there, so I show the two approaches, physics space and also data driven. So based on the machine learning, in that case, we use experimental data only, right? And there, so you see here an example, I mean, the, the one of solid state batteries, right? This is fully based on experimental data. And the number of experimental points here, so to our surprise, it was not to very, I mean, it was not needed to collect a big, big, big data set, right? So we have number of points of the order 100, right? So 100 experimental points, 100 experimental conditions, right? If, if, the, if these experimental points are of high quality, therefore you can reproduce these uh, points, you do the experiment the five times and you get more or less the same result but a very, very small error, right? So you can trust to this data and you can get useful uh, machine learning predictions, right? Uh, for example, as uh, this kind of graph I show you already for the slurry, it's a classification that very quickly, depending on the formulation of that you have in the, in the preparation of these solid state uh, electrolytes, you will have a prediction about the quality of this uh, film, right? It will be heterogeneous like this one or homogeneous with higher uniformity like this one, right? If you want to make uh, regression predictions, I mean numbers, usually by experience, you will need a high, larger data sets, right? In that situation, you need to collect probably 10,000 experimental points, right? But for classification, so you need a, yeah, you need a few. It was a surprise for us because usually when we speak about machine learning, you also speak about big data. And we think that, okay, we need to collect a lot of data, right? And by our surprise, we, we, we found that it was not needed. I mean, if the, if the experimental data is of high quality, you can get nice uh, predictions for machine learning right? and useful predictions. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We have another question, uh, Naureen. Uh, hi, Alejandro. Actually, the second question Juan asked, it was my question as well. Mm, but uh, I, I am I am out of this uh, beyond battery or machine learning. I don't uh, know much any of them about. I just have a curiosity, like you, you said just that uh, you don't need a big amount of data to uh, predict this kind of uh, things. So it's my just my uh, thought that uh, if I, I am trying to predict, uh, I'm trying to optimize the processes, any kind of process, um, uh, except the, like, I don't have many data. Like, I'm just thinking about my work now that I, I don't have many data, but I'm trying to optimize one of my process and uh, trying to figure out, and there are not much, much data in literature as well. So what do you think like uh, we should consider while first at the beginning, if I want to now start something like this, that I want to make a machine learning thing from, from my process or my field. So what should I consider first at the beginning? Nice, the nice question, beginning. Narin. So I'm very happy that you, maybe you intend to start with this and it's great. <laughs> no, so I, I was... I try yes. to I try to learn some uh, like this Python MATLAB myself uh, while the the um, pandemic started, but uh, I don't work anything related to this. And I also follow your Twitter, <laughs> so oh, I, cool. I <laughs> you will see there are some some news. I don't so understand <laughs> many, but I try. <laughs> Great, great. So yeah, I, I, I would recommend you to start with a software called ERA, ARA, you know, R that is yeah, widely yeah. used in statistics, probably you know it and you maybe yeah. use it already because there you already have some preload of machine learning techniques, right? You can do, for example, random forest or you can do um, a decision tree that are very simple and you can even build kind of simple neural network models, right? Um, I would say the first thing when you have a data set is um, the doing some statistics, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and getting knowledge with the, your data set. So typically, so what you will do is you will plot, uh, you know, as you will have, I don't know, you will have maybe 10 variables, right? And you will try to plot uh, your data set. Uh, you will project the data set in, in two dimensions or in three dimensions because it's easier to do. 
And this is something that you can use using a technique called principal component analysis, PCA, which is mm -hmm. uh, from statistics that allows you projecting the data set, multidimensional data set in something with lower dimensions that are, this is easier to understand, right? Once you get this, you can have an idea, thanks to this technique, uh, what are the most relevant parameters, the ones that are influencing the most your outputs, right? And then you will pick them to train a, a, a very simple machine learning model by very powerful, it's called K-means, which is a supervised machine learning technique that allow, allows you to identify classes, right? I'm saying, okay, uh, I don't know if you are interested, of, uh, once again, maybe in the quality of a film, right? It's a, mm -hmm. a class, it's a, disc a qualitative descriptor, right? High quality, medium quality, low quality. This tool, that is a, you can see it as a black box. It will help you to identify these classes, right? To regroup the data according to these three classes. And then, so you can use these identified classes to train a method, for example, support vector machine is one, one classical method for that, or random forest to do classification, right? When you give now new data, the model will be able to predict uh, that you will have a high quality film or low quality film, right? So my, my recommendation will be in terms of software using R because it's simpler, uh, you know, from in my group, we start in that way eh? we start with R uh, mm -hmm. and we start with a master student, Ricardo. Um, this guy actually, he, he published this paper I showed at the beginning about the slurry, right? Machine learning applied to slurry uh, influence on porosity and loading. He did all the job with R. So nothing sophisticated like Python. Uh, Python is fine, it's very nice, but uh, Keras, TensorFlow and stuff like that, no, R, right? And it's a simple way to start. And then uh, doing some, getting some knowledge with your data set, right? Representing this data set in multiple dimensions to see a bit, uh, yeah, what are the variables that, that weight the more in the outputs? And then using K-means or super vector machine to doing this uh, black box uh, job to predict, right? To, yeah. So that will be my, my recommendation. Don't hesitate to mail me also if you, you need some advice or, or uh, you know, maybe some literature or book on this or, yeah, no, no problem. I can put you also in contact with my students working on this thing and they will be happy to help, I'm sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was You're nice welcome, Nauri. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Well, if not, I think it's lunchtime. It's uh, it's really we, we could be chatting for hours because your talks are always so engaging. But uh, I think we we have to stop here today. I thank you again very much, Alejandro, for for accepting and for keeping it with with the delay and so on. And no let's let's hope to see you soon again. Thank, thank <laughs> you very much, Rosa, once again for the thank invitation. You. It's a wonderful initiative, and uh, well, thank you very much. Looking forward. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. It was really nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Laura uh, takes uh, care of everything. Yeah. <laughs> bon, bon, bon appetit. <laughs> so, guys, it's lunchtime. We continue at 3.30 with the last invited talk. That is Elvira Fortunato. And after Elvira Fortunato, we will start with our dog fun talks. We will have four today, I think, during one hour. So it's like short talks, 15 minutes. I hope you like them. And uh, just to let you know, the dog farm talks, they will be in the, so the, the dog farm people will be at the seminar room at Digma. So if you prefer to go to the seminar room instead of being in the computer, the ones that are in at Digma or at LCN2 and so on, you are welcome. I, th I don't know the capacity of the room. Uh, if Anna is around, she can tell us. But as long as we can keep the capacity, you can go, you can come to the seminar room. Okay. Uh, the capacity is 20 people. So yeah. I think okay. I think we can fit some of you in the in the room. So yes, I see you at 3.30 for Elvira's Fortunato talk. If you have any questions, now is the time. Questions for me, posters, talks? Uh, she received a bachelor degree in physics and materials engineering and later on the PhD in micro microelectronics and optoelectronics. Currently, she's also vice director of the Nova University and director of the Materials Research Center of Cine Cinemat in Portugal. Uh, a professor Abira Fortunato, a peer at the European Research on Transparent Electronics using oxide semiconductors. And in fact, she's co-inventor of the concept of paper electronics worldwide. 
I would like to highlight that she, in 2008, she received an advanced uh, European uh, an advanced grant from the European Research Council, and another one in 2018. She has received many national and international awards. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, just maybe a, a few of them. She received the Doctor Honoris Causa from the University of Galati, the Vlaise Pascal Medal from the European Academy of Science. And recently, also, she received the European Commission's Horizon Impact Award 2020. Uh, she's a member of many different academic science, the editorial advisory boards. And related to her scientific output, I mean, there's lots of impressive numbers of around 700 publications, H uh, index of, of 55, um, many patents, uh, many of them granted, in, uh, highlighting one also granted to Samsung company. So uh, I could carry on uh, when talking about her, uh, her career, which is uh, very impressive, but I think it's better I will let her talk and listen to her research. And um, Professor Fortunato, she will talk today about paper electronics. So please, uh, whenever you, you want, you can start. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for your, um, for your invitation. It is a great pleasure for me to, to share with you and uh, with your PhD students uh, within this uh, summer school, the work that uh, we are doing in terms of uh, materials, advanced materials, functional materials. And today I will talk a little bit about uh, paper electronics. In fact, uh, we, we are leading this type of work uh, in the world. We built by the first time uh, a paper transistor and we show that it is possible to use uh, cellulose and renewable and materials from renewable sources uh, to do electronics, uh, also taking into account all the issues related to sustainability which as you know it's nowadays uh, 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 it's not an option is an, ob an an obligation for all of us and since we are working with materials for electronics uh, this is something that uh, we need to take into account so as it was uh, mentioned my name is Elvira Fortunato I'm a professor at uh, the material science department at Nova University of Lisbon and uh, simultaneously I'm actually the vice director of Nova University for the area of research. So uh, the key areas we have in our laboratory are not only related to green electronics. We have a lot of work on transparent electronics. We use oxide, uh, metal oxide based materials for making uh, electronics. So in fact, we are using uh, metal oxides as uh, semiconductors uh, and uh, we are not using silicon and we are we are trying to replace uh, silicon for this type of um, of uh, semiconductors and uh, we have a lot of work on transparent electronics for example uh, we have uh, patents with samsung especially in the area of thin film transistors to be used for the next generation of OLED, especially OLED displays. So besides transparent electronics, we work also on paper electronics, and this is the topic that I'm going to talk to you today. Besides that, we have also some activity on electrochemical devices, uh, on biosensors and microfluidics. Uh, we have two clean rooms, so we have all the faci facilities related to microelectronic technology to do not only integrated circuits, but also sensors and micro conventional microfluidics. And besides that, we also work on nanoplasmonics, specially applied to solar cells. We have a, a huge tradition and uh, we even the, the group start with the morphosilicon to be used on solar cells, on thin film solar cells. And nowadays we are exploiting the use also of uh, um, solar cells, but uh, since the materials, um, morphosilicon is a little bit already studied, we are trying to combine a morphosilicon, for example, with these new perovskites uh, based materials and also try to use nanoplasmonics in, in order to increase 
the solar efficiency of, uh, of the devices. So this is a, a photograph uh, of our of our campus, just to, to reduce the, the sound. Of our campus, the Nova University has nine schools, nine faculties. My faculty is Faculty of Science and Technology. This is here, where in, in this picture, you can see over there the Tagus River, and on the upper side you have Lisbon. So the Faculty of Science and Technology is just on the other side of Lisbon. And on your left, you have the beaches, Costa da Caparica and the Ocean Atlantic. So we are very well situated. So we have the, the beaches just five kilometers from, uh, from uh, the, uni the, the faculty. And we have uh, also five kilometers separated from, uh, from Lisbon, the, the capital. So this is a huge campus and we have uh, all the engineering uh, and science uh, degrees not only bachelor's, but also master degrees and all, all, all the areas. So we have here around 8,000 students in this Caparica campus. So uh, in terms of the outline of, my, of this presentation, I will start just with a brief introduction why we choose to use Piper for electronic applications. After that, I will show you some of the properties of cellulose and after some applications that we are doing uh, at CENIMAT. And after that, uh, some conclusions and uh, uh, at the end, the challenges and opportunities in, in, in the area of paper electronics. As uh, we know, and uh, as it is common to each institution, either a company or a university, a research group, we need to have a strategy. And we have a strategy in two, in two levels. The first one is in the area of materials, and the second one is in the area of the technologies. In terms of materials, and we work a lot with the conventional materials and also we synthesize some, some materials, but we are always looking for abundant and non-toxic materials uh, to be used either in an integrated circuit, in a sensor, in a solar cell, whatever. And since we need to process, we need to transform the materials for a specific in a specific product or a device. In terms of the technologies we are looking for, we want we are using simple and low energy processes. In some cases, we are using plastic substrates, so we need to take into account uh, temperature, the final temperature temperature deposition and also the gases and also the, the, the materials involved with the technology must be always green. Also in terms of chemistry, we are trying to avoid the use of solvent organics and some of the reactions are water-based in the area of, um, uh, uh, of chemistry. So what is in these uh, the paper electronics? For example, uh, just before starting to explain what is paper electronics, I would like to share with you what we are doing globally today. This is what we are generating. We have nowadays, uh, we are generating what is called high tech trash. This is the electronic products, most, most of them related to, uh, to the TIC, uh, TIC devices. And this is maybe not the best way for recycling, in that case, the copper for, from uh, the PCBs. Also, this is not the best way for selection, different materials. Also, maybe we need to change this type of thing. Of course, paper electronics is not a solution for all, all of these problems, but we, as a uh, working on materials, we need to take these problems in, in our mind. Also in this, um, in, in this slide, we, we have the most important international electronic waste shipments. Indeed, we are not solving this type of problems. We are the the local the we are moving this type of problems from the north part of the earth for the south part of uh, the globe. And we are exporting uh, these uh, electronic waste, especially for some countries in Africa, 
to India and to China. And of course, this is not the best solution for this type of problems. So why we choose to use paper or cellulose? Cellulose is the nature's mo most common building block. And in a bioeconomy and circular economy in which renewable materials are one of the keys to a more sustainable future, maybe cellulose has an active and a crucial role. And cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer and environmentally friendly, is a material that is flexible and unbreakable. Uh, the cost is low is the lightest known material. The technology is very well established. For example, I don't know if you have an idea, but the, the, for producing office paper, the, the technology that we have today in place, the, the, the velocity for making office paper is at 100 kilometers per hour. This is the velocity of the machines that are producing this type of paper, which is office paper. So we have a very good technology and the technology is very well established. We don't need to invent the technology for making paper. This is very well established. Cellulose presents very good dielectric properties and this is quite important, especially for uh, electronic applications because uh, concerning the materials we are using for making electronics, we need to have semiconductors conductors, and also insulators. And cellulose is a very good insulator material. Paper is ubiquitous, so we have paper everywhere. For example, if we want to make some devices or if we want to use paper for some specific application, it's not a problem because paper is everywhere. And at, at the end, this is recyclable. And also this is a quite important because if we are targeting, if we are applying cellulose for making some uh, uh, electronics or some uh, devices, at the end, we don't have within this type of technology, the problem that we have with the electronic waste. So just for you to have an idea about the some of the properties of cellulose, here I have two uh, examples of two SEM scanning electron micrographs on the left side, cellulose coming from the trees, vegetal cellulose, and on the right side, uh, another image of nanocellulose. This particular cellulose is coming from, uh, uh, from some uh, bacteria that I will explain you in the next slides. But again, if we look for these two images, what we can observe is just a, a 3D network of cellulose fibers, the only difference is related to the scale of these fibers. For example, on the left image, you have the scale of 100 micrometers, and on the on the right one, we have 100 nanometers. So this is in both pictures, we have cellulose fibers, but the dimension of the cellulose fibers is completely different. And also, if we take a look about the structural, structural, stru structural, sorry, sorry, structural properties of these, um, these cellulose, uh, on the left one, we have the, the uh, a typical XRD for uh, cellulose coming from, uh, from the trees, from, uh, from uh, vegetal cellulose. And on the right one, the same um, structural properties from nanocellulose. And in both cases, we can see that the material presents uh, some crystallinity. And even in the case of the nanocellulose, the degree of the crystallinity is higher than for the microcellulose. And also if we compare, for example, the optical properties of cellulose coming from the trees or cellulose coming from a bacteria, we observe that uh, normal paper usually is opaque, the paper is not transparent, but the nanocellulose, since the size of the, the fibers is quite small, is of the order of nanometers, 
we don't have interf interference from light from the radiation with the with the material and this type of paper this nanocellulose becomes transparent and this is how it looks like a piece of paper or nanocellulose produced by a specific bacteria and these bacteria are inside something that we know and we use which is vinegar vinegar has inside heat this type of bacteria they are uh, good for health uh, they are not pathogenic uh, the name is acetobacter and this type of um, of bacteria they produce produce this type of uh, nanocellulose they work like a nano extruder and they extrude these nanofibers and they will produce this type of membranes based on nanocellulose and also this is important because we used to say that we need always to have alternatives to the type or to the sources of materials that we we are using and for example for if we want to use cellulose coming from vinegar or from a solution of vinegar we need just to wait between two or, or three days to have a membrane with the thickness similar to a thickness of a sheet of paper, which has around 100 micrometers. And again, if we want to, to have the same uh, sheet of paper, but from cellulose coming from the wood, we need to wait between five, in some cases, 10 years to have the tree with the, with the NF height in order to extract cellulose from the wood. So now I will present you some of the, the devices that uh, we are uh, working on in, at uh, CENIMAT. And we will start with some um, electronic devices. Uh, in 2008, uh, we present by the first time uh, a paper transistor. And uh, as you know, we are surrounded by the, the, these, um, these things, the e-paper, the e-books, and the idea is to change, to, to move from a conventional book, a paper book, uh, from a conventional newspaper, a magazine, and try to use uh, uh, electronic equipment, an iPad or something similar, to read uh, the, what we want to read in this type of equipment. This is why it is e-paper or e-something. But since we are using cellulose as an electronic material, and our main idea is not to avoid the use of cellulose, but is to use cellulose for other applications, for electronic applications, we switch the E from the left to the right. And instead of having e-paper, we have paper e because we are still working on paper, on cellulose for electronic applications. And in fact, we have a brand. This is uh, uh, the image on the on the right of the screen. And in fact, this is green electronics for the future. This was already done in 2008. Now we have even the green deal coming from the European Commission, but all these type of things have been um, uh, installed in our laboratory some years ago. So in fact, the, the paper or cellulose has a physical support and an active function for the transistor. Here, this is a very simple cross section, uh, a schematic showing the cross section of these particular transistors. We have different kinds of transistor. This is a transistor that it the name is field effect transistor and uh, it's quite easy we start with a sheet of paper and we deposit on one side the semiconductor and on the other side we deposit the gate electrode uh, the cellulose is the insulator of this type of transistor and the semiconductor must be complete electrically is isolated isolated from the gate electrode. Otherwise, we will have a short circuit between the semiconductor and the gate. So here, for the semiconductor and also for the gate, we are also using alternative materials. We are not working with silicon. And we start to work with this type of metal oxides. For example, in this particular case, we use for the semiconductor an alloy of gallium indium zinc oxide and for the gate, uh, indium zinc oxide 
field. So ICO presents a very high conductivity, is also transparent, belongs to the family of TCOs, transparent conducting oxides, and GIZO is a semiconductor. Of course, we can we start with zinc oxide, but in order to have more stable transistors and with a higher electron mobility, we need to, to add to zinc oxide, we need to, get to, uh, to add gallium oxide and indium oxide. And also this is already adopted by by the industry for some areas, especially in the area of transparent electronics. So here, this is an example of an IV characteristic of a transistor. And what this is a log, a semi-logarithmic scale. So here we have the current, the drain current as a function of the gate voltage. And this type of transistors, they, 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 they used to, we used to say they work like a switch uh, for the reverse in the reverse region, they they are they are off. It means that the the current is quite low, and when they are on, when we switch the voltage to to uh, to, a, to 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 the direct part, the current goes on, and the the current uh, increases orders of magnitude. This is why this is a semi-logarithmic scale. And we used to say that the device is the on state. So we have the off and on state. This is why this type of field effect transistors, they work like a switch. So also uh, more recently, and uh, since uh, we start to work with these bacterial cellulose coming from uh, vinegar, also we built um, a transistor. And in fact, the transistor based on this bacterial cellulose, besides being transparent, it presents also higher, uh, uh, a better electrical performance because the surface, the roughness is lower than the roughness of uh, conventional office paper. And also the electrical mobility, which is a little bit a figure of merit of these transistors is much better. So this is also a cross section of uh, physically of, of a real uh, transistor. So here you can see all the layers. For example, here we have the the, the gray part is the is the pipe, but also you can see some holes between the porosity, which is related to the, to the porosity, because as you know, this is a 3D network of cellulose fibers. And here the green layer is, is the GIZO semiconductor. So you can see the, the, the thickness is very, very small. So it's less than 10 nanometers, but covers quite well even the roughness of the, of the material. And after that, we have the electrode and just to see how conformal, conformable it is. The coverage is quite, uh, is very well done by this type of uh, materials. So since the transistors, they don't work uh, alone, we need to integrate transistors with other transistors, with other, uh, with other devices to build, to make integrated circuits. This is an example of a CMOS uh, circuit, which is the combination of uh, N-type TFT with a P-type TFT. Also the P-type TFT uh, is based on metal oxides. In this case was uh, tin oxide. So we have a N-type transistor based on GIZO and the P-type transistor based on uh, tin oxide. And this is an example how it is showing that it is possible to have uh, also CMOS uh, for integrated circuits. Also, since we are using paper, which is a very low cost material, also we are trying to use low cost technologies to build the devices. And also we are using printing, uh, printing technology. And this is an example how you can print, for example, uh, zinc oxide over cellulose to build um, uh, a transistor using a very, a very easy screen, um, a very easy printing technology. Also other examples where we are printing uh, several, uh, not only films, but also uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles to build uh, what is mentioned electro electrolyte gated transistors. And also other examples, uh, we had in the past uh, several pro European projects 
uh, and coming from uh, these European projects, we are able to, to use paper for different, uh, for different kinds of applications. For example, we can have an, inter uh, an integrated circuit, for example, with a gas sensor and also with um, having a, a, an electrochromic based display. So we can integrate a low cost display all together with the, the electronics and the gas sensors and also other examples of some electronic integrated circuits. Just to show you that in 2016, we became finalists of the European Inventor Award. We didn't succeed, but since uh, we, we have been chosen as three of the, the, one of the three finalists all over Europe, it was quite important because this was already um, uh, done by the European Patent Office. So besides these electronics, also we work on solar cells. As I mentioned before, the group start to work with the amorphous silicon for thin film solar cells. And again, we are exploiting the use of paper. And in the case of solar cells, we are using Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak has already an aluminum foil uh, coated on the, on the paper. And we use this aluminum foil as the back electrode for the solar cell. So part of the solar cell is already, the, the, is already there, especially the, the rear contact. And we optimize all the deposition conditions for amorphous silicon solar cells, since, of course, we need to reduce the final deposition temperature. And we succeed to build, for example, a solar cell on these uh, Tetra Pak uh, substrates. And again, also, we are able to produce solar cells on paper and also on these uh, bacterial cellulose, on these membranes coming from uh, uh, bacteria vin vinegar, from, uh, from veganer. And we achieved, I guess, a world record for, record for this type of solar cells on these substrates. And the efficiency was five, around 5%, which is quite enough for indoor applications. We are not exploiting and we don't want to use this for uh, conventional um, power gener generations. So other example of applications where we are using uh, paper is related to, to biosensors. And uh, in the case of uh, microfluidic technologies, for example, here in this slide, you have the three common uh, technologies used for microfluidics. On the left one, we have the conventional one based on uh, lithography, based on the microelectronic uh, technologies, where we use, uh, we have the masters, we have, uh, we need to use photolithography using SU8, which is a, a photoresist and also PDMS. Uh, on the middle one, we have an embossing technology. Of course, the cost is uh, over the right is going down. So, it is possible also to build uh, microfluidic devices using an embossing technology. Of course, we are limited to the resolution. We cannot achieve, achieve a so high resolution as in the case of lithography. And on the right one, we have lab on paper. So lab on paper was uh, invented in 2008 by Professor Whitesides in Harvard University. And here we are exploiting the, the properties, the hydrophilic, the hydrophilic properties of paper. And by using a very low cost technology, we can build, we can have microfluidic out of the paper. And this is very easy. We just are using for making lab on paper. Uh, we are just using a Xerox uh, photocopy, a Xerox uh, machine. In this specific Xerox machines, the ink inside is wax. So we coat paper with, uh, with wax, with the drawing we want. And uh, after that, we coat, we print wax on top of the paper. If we put the, the paper on a hot plate at 140 degrees for two minutes, the wax melts and diffuses through the thickness of the paper. 
And since Pipevax is hydrophobic, works like we are able to produce inside the thickness of paper hydrophobic barriers. So wax is hydrophobic, paper is hydrophilic, and in that way we are able to build channels or to make um, these uh, microfluidic on, uh, on, on paper. Here this is a movie showing um, a device for glucose. This is a colorimetric sensor, a diagnostic test for glucose. As you can see, all the area around the channels are with wax. wax. In these channels where the, the, the liquid is moving on, we don't have wax. So we can define exactly the way how the fluids are going into a sheet of paper by using, by using this very low cost technology. This is a case of a colorimetric uh, biosensor for glucose. And uh, uh, for example, the, this was already done in our laboratory. It is very easy to develop an app for a mobile phone. And by having the, the calibration curves as a function of the intensity of the color we have, because the intensity of the color is, is related with the concentration of glucose. It's very easy, for example, to, to measure not only glucose, but also other biomarkers. This is an example of other, other uh, a final glucose sensor. Also, we can use VAX and we can print the we can print several times uh, the same sheet of paper just to have in both sites. We are using VAX as the encapsulation for this type of sensors, and this is how they look like. Also, here just to show you how it is possible to infer the concentration of glucose as a function of the color intensity. And more recently, we are exploiting also the use of uh, laser, and we are able to transform the surface of paper to graphene. And this is an example how it is possible to write with a CO2 laser to carbonize the surface of uh, paper and build, for example, electrodes for biosensors. This is an example of um, uh, a tree, a tree uh, electrode system for electrochemistry, for electrochemical sensors. And this is how it works. Also for, this is an enzymatic uh, biosensor for glucose. And as you can see, these are the, 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 the current as a function of the glucose concentration and also we are using uh, we are using some interference just to, to to infer how selective is the sensor so besides these uh, biosensors also we work on electrochromic devices we built some um, electrolyte gated transistors in that case also we are using tungsten oxide which is an electrochromic material and we use this electrochromic material with two functions within the transistor, works like is the active element of the transistor, like the semiconductor. But since we have a color change, we can use this type of transistor simultaneously as the pixel of the display and also the transistor. So we have integrated in the same device two functions, the on-off switch and also the color. And also this is possible because we are working with this family of metal oxides. Other examples also, we are able to print uh, these electrochromic materials. This is an active matrix, sorry, uh, a static uh, a matrix using this type of um, electrochromic materials. Also, we are using electrochromic materials like tungsten oxide as a sensor to detect some specific uh, bacteria. This is the case of these um, bacteria that are electro electrochemically active, like the geobacter. And as a final conclusion, our main idea is to try to use paper for all these type of applications for antennas, for memories, for batteries, for display, for color sensors, also for uh, uh, 
chemistry for uh, chemistry sensors for solar cells and also for electronics so using and exploiting cellulose in combination with other metal oxides also with other sustainable materials we are able to build uh, low cost electronics and the green more green electronics of course we have some challenges and some opp opportunities for this new type of technologies especially at the healthcare for water for food and the internet of things for all these type of uh, applications we need to have devices we need to have the diagnostic tests we need we need to have sensors and we need to have electronics that need to have a low cost otherwise it is impossible to put in all the objects that we want to for example to to communicate especially for the internet of things we need to develop uh, very low cost electronics so this is just a picture of our uh, group here and caparica and besides the knowledge to acknowledge the persons the team it's quite important also to acknowledge not only the national funds from FCT and Portugal 2020, but especially the funds coming from uh, the European Commission, uh, Horizon 2020. Now we are applying to projects to uh, Horizon, Horizon Europe, but especially to the European Research Council. We are very quite proud we obtain already in our group seven ERC grants. For example, I'm now running my second uh, advanced grant from ERC. And in fact, this was a, a huge contribution for the success of our research. And finally, I would like to thank you for your, your attention and I'm available for questions, comments. Please be, be free to, to ask me whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elvira, for this very inspiring uh, talk. Let's see, there is there a question in the audience? Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Yeah, exactly. Just click the your hand so I can know you have a question. Let's see. We have Carolina. Okay, <laughs> I can say that. Okay, Carolina, go ahead, please. I have a, I have a question. Oh, well, okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so first, a uh, very uh, nice presentation. I really enjoyed the topic. I uh, just have a few questions. Um, you said that, for example, when you compare the, that it's much, much faster to do uh, one sheet of paper with vinegar compared to paper. But how much can you produce from, let's say, vinegar, one, one liter of vinegar, how much uh, cellulose can you produce? Yes, this is not done by myself. This is a collaboration that we have the, with the biology department. So this is a colleague from Minu University and they are uh, studying the culture media for this particular bacteria. And since uh, we start to work with paper electronics, and in fact, this uh, nano paper is also 100% cellulose, he asked me if we can collaborate and using this type of membranes. So I don't know, the, the, the um, this is quite fast because as I mentioned for growing a sheet of uh, paper or a membrane, it took two, two to three days. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the specifications about the culture itself, about the, what type of vinegar, what, what they had. Okay, and it's, just- it's, and it's very fast, it's two, three days. Okay, and just another quick question. So as you mentioned, the cellulose is, it works as a dielectric for the transistors. Is, uh, is there any way that, for example, with the, with the food that the bacteria eats, uh, that this cellulose can be um, doped or behave differently, not just as a, as a dielectric, but can have, for example, different properties? Or the cellulose coming from the bacteria, they are almost 100% cellulose. The, the cellulose is quite pure because this is nature. And usually I used to say nature is perfect. Cellulose, the degree of crystallinity is also higher than the cellulose coming from the wood. Nevertheless, uh, uh, now we have some projects with the paper industry and also it is possible 
depending on the additives, because the paper that we are using today, they have a lot of additives. But these additives are for the paper industry, for printing, and they, this paper is optimized for printing. It's not, it's not optimized for electronics. But we have now projects with the paper, with paper industry, just we, we, to see what is the best composition and what are the most appropriate additives specific for, for electronic applications. But yes, okay. it is possible to change the, the additives for the, the bacteria, not so easy because this is, uh, is more, um, it's more difficult to interact with the culture itself, but with the, the vegetal paper, it is possible. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Thank you. I think Manel okay. wants to yeah. Manel, yes. Uh, well, I have a, a quick question. Um, I don't. I don't see uh, how can we get um, from bacteria uh, the, the the primary uh, matter, which is cellulose. I, I would like to, if you can explain me a little bit, how can we get from bacteria the cellulose that we use to produce paper? Yes, this in as I mentioned to your colleague, this is a collaboration that I have with another professor from. Uh, Minu University. Nevertheless, it's even the vinegar that we are using in our food for our salads, they have this bacteria. And for example, even in a conventional uh, uh, bottle of vinegar, for example, if we are not using vinegar for a while, we can see inside the liquid some membranes with uh, a strange aspect. Okay. These membranes are nanocellulose done by this bacteria. The, ba the bacteria work like a nano extruder. They extrude okay. these wires, these fibers. Okay, so uh, it, is that, it is that bacteria produces the cellulose. Yes, the bacteria, they produce the cellulose. In, okay. And we call it nanocellulose because the fibers are quite small. Okay. The diameter is around uh, tens of uh, nanometers. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so much and for your presentation. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know there are more questions. Is there anyone raising the hands or? It's uh, Fabiao has the hand raised. I don't know if you see it, but... I don't, I'm not saying who, who is Fabiao, you say, okay. Yes, <laughs> Hi, Fabiao. it was me, can hey, ask. hello. Uh, Hello, and uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. I have a quite general question, and sometimes, from what I remember from my, some years ago, I heard about electronic paper, one of the disadvantages uh, would be, can this paper be fold? Can this be bent and still yes. be operational? For yes. example, when you speak about your biosensors, can I squeeze this piece of paper and then stretch it and it will still work? Not if you make like this, for example, but especially for the diagnostic tests, they are quite small. So we don't need to fold it because they are some strips, like the strips that we are using for glucose tests, the normal ones. So they are quite small. We can bend, not uh, like that, not like that, but uh, we can bend without, without any, any problem. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Because one of the things that we are exploiting for paper is flexibility and conformability. We can adapt paper to any 3D form. This is one of the advantages. I understand. Thank you. Okay. There are more questions. Um, I don't see yeah, no. I don't see any fun, but if anyone wants to ask, they can speak straight away. Just... Yes, because I'm trying to look the hands, but I'm not sure if I can catch what otherwise. Otherwise, I, I will I will ask you a question in the meantime. Um, so what, I, I was wondering when you use this um this uh, cellulose as dielectric, do that to the fact that you have some kind of rugosity, is this a problem for um, for the for working as a dielectric? I mean, you have some kind of problems with uh, leakage currents and and yes. visibility or how you can sort this out? Yes, of course, uh, it's not the best dielectric uh, we have. Of course, silicon oxide is much is much better, but okay. also silicon oxide is produced by, by using other technologies. 
Yes, he, here, with the, in fact, the, the paper that we are using, the roughness is quite high, is of the order of micrometers. And as you, as I mean, as I show you before, a cross section of a device, the, the films that we are depositing over there, they are quite, the coverage is very high. So this type of uh, very high um, roughness, it's not a problem because it's much is orders of magnitude in comparison with the thickness that we are depositing. So we, it's not affecting. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, another question I was going to ask you. Um, I was wondering with all these uh, technologies that we try to aim at going to, you know, green, green materials, green technologies, I was wondering uh, for the for the for the electrodes, uh, the electrodes that you're using as source to then get, are you doing lithography or evaporation? Is this still a, a bottleneck for developing yeah, yeah. devices? Let's say. That's why we are not using a CO2. Now we are using a CO2 radiation, a conventional laser, to carbonize the surface of paper, and we are able to transform the surface of the cellulose to graphene. Yeah. This is the, but the not mask. all the devices you're doing that. No, this is the last part that you show. Yes. So, so this is a maskless approach. Yes. We don't need to deposit another material and we don't need to pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Because also paper, we cannot, yes. use conventional yes. technologies, we cannot use lithography, acetone, and also all these type of reagents and yeah. solvents. But, but is, is, is it compatible, the, um, it's compa the compatible. cellulose with the lithography as well? So you could do the lithography? Yes it, is. Well. yes, it is. And we have some work, but uh, we are using a very low-cost material with a very yes. high-cost technology. Yes. Sometimes, of course, if we want to show a proof of concept, we can yes. use it. But for a regular application, it's not well-balanced. Yeah, yeah, sure. So sure. thank you very much. Is there more questions? Um, I don't see more questions. Any I don't, I don't see it either. No, it's your chance <laughs> to ask. Yes, a very good chance to ask. Also, I present my email if you have. Uh, I guess I show in my in the first in the first slide. Sorry. Yes. My email. I don't know if. Yes, I can share again. You have here. My. Share screen. My email. Yes. So if, if you have any any question or even comment, you can send me an email, and uh, I will uh, answer. Yeah. Thank you very much. If some questions come later, then uh, I don't see there is no questions. So, so in this no, this in this case, uh, yeah, we thank you again, Elvira, for your nice talk. <laughs> very okay. inspiring. Thank um, you very much. Uh, and, all the, and success for the PhD students. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you very much. It was a pleasure, Elvira. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, people, uh, we have like five minutes for the next for the next session. So let's take a little a little break because we have like five minutes. We will start at four thirty with the Dopan talks. And um, well, I hope you like them. So see you at 4.30. Gracias, Marta. Gracias, Laura. Ens veiem. Sí, ha sigut xula. En general, super estan bé. Merci. Adéu. Ara baixo, eh, a la sala. Ara vaig a fer unes coses i baixo. José, estàs listo? Sí, sí, claro. Se escucha bien, ¿no? Sí, 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 perfecto. No se escucha el ruido de fondo, es que hay mucho ruido aquí, ¿no? No, el que tiene ruido... Artur, ¿estás aquí? Hola, hola. Hola, sí, ya. Ok, so you can hear me. This is just a sound check. Good. Uh, Daniel, can you come here, please? Okay, yeah, just to check your microphone, if you can turn it on.
¿Hablo, hablo? Sí. Hola, hola. Hello. ¿Eh? Hola. Laura, hola. ah, no, no, no. Oh, José, catalán. Hi, how are you? Hi, uh, good, good. Can Thanks. you hear Daniel speaking? Hello. Yeah, yeah, I think a little bit uh, high, uh, a little bit louder. Ah, uh, you hear me now? Is it fine? Yeah, 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 it's fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Sí, eso es. Um, ¿Puedo poner un timer? ¿Sí? Todo bien, es que es justo. Bueno, sí, para que como lo tengo un poco estructurado. Um, Artur, are you here? No, no está. <laughs> Hola, Ana, ¿y Laura, yo? Oh, Artur, Artur Romanov. No, no nada, adiós. <laughs> No, es porque al ser un micro toda la zona va a Malamén y para Birli, pero los dios no es. Eh, ¿Cómo pasan los slides? Uh, no. um, vale. Bueno, aquí, cuando apuntas el botón. Vale, el puntero. Si no lo encuentras, puede que se quede ahí. Ah, entonces, ¿dónde apunto ahí? O, o... Ah, vale, aquí. Ahora, como ya no te he estado moviendo la vez. Ah, vale, vale, vale. Vale, vale. Yes. <coughs> ah, vale, es el puntero, vale, es la flecha, vale. Bueno, si no, da igual. ¿eh? Vale, perfecto. Vale. Si puedes pasar. Ah, sí, vale. Vale, va un poco con... Ah, sí. Perfecto. Bueno, gracias, ¿eh? Vale. ¿Cómo? Ah. Eh, ¿Me pongo aquí o...? Es, es esto, ¿no? Ah. Vale, perfecto. Vale, entonces... Vale. Vale, esto lo verán, o sea, no lo verán... O sea, lo verán en una pantalla aparte, quiero decir. O sea, sí. yo aparecer un recuadro de... Vale, vale, vale. Se ve muy grande y aquí abajo un pequeño... Vale, vale, vale. Digo, joder, voy a, voy a, voy a ocupar toda la pantalla. ¿no? Voy a ser que es. Sí, sí, sí. Hola. I'm fine with the mask, but uh, if you want, yes, you are fine. So it's a bit, uh, okay. And it's I... Okay, perfect. Oh. Okay.
Cuando hable, que es mejor que mire la cámara o que mire mejor la cámara. Ah. Donde quieras, ¿eh? también, Daniel. O sea, si quieres irlos mirando a ellos también. Vale, vale. Bueno, creo que miraré la cámara, menos fácil. Vale. Mucho, mucho movimiento, si no. If you want to start, so I hope everyone is here. We, it's five, it's four thirty because if not, we get very late. And today we, I hope we finish earlier <laughs> than yesterday. So Jose, when you want to. Okay, Laura. Uh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's good. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, well, I'm going to present the first session of the DocFam Fellows Talks. And we are going to start with Daniel Vera. Uh, Daniel Vera is from Spain and he completed his studies at the engineering school uh, in Grenoble, INP, France, where he specialized in biomedical engineering. Uh, actually, now he's doing his PhD at the Institute of Microelectronics of Barcelona, EMBCNM, and his research is related with the development of new methodologies for the study of intestinal tissues by using biomimetic hydrogels to reproduce spatial configuration of the intestinal mucosa. So, uh, Daniel, when you're ready. Thank you, Jose. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so, uh, today I'm going to present uh, the last results of uh, my PhD project. Um, the title of, the, of my PhD project is uh, called uh, Microtechnologies to Develop a Bioprinted uh, Hydrogel Based Intestinal Tube on Chip with Integrated Sensing Capabilities. This work uh, has been performed in uh, two institutes, the Institute of Microelectronics of Barcelona and the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia. So my presentation will be structured in three parts, which are uh, divided in the main topics I've been working on these uh, last months. Uh, in particular, the 3D printing of hydrogels, the fabrication of uh, microfluidic chip, uh, the simulations, and the design of the electrodes. So first, I would like to give a brief introduction to uh, Gaton chip models. Gaton chip models are um, in vitro, well, they are advanced in vitro intestinal models in which is the intestinal cells are cultured uh, under fluid flow uh, with uh, microfluidic devices. The advantage of, this, uh, of these systems is that they uh, reproduce uh, key dynamic uh, conditions in which uh, intestinal cells are. Uh, for example, the peristaltic movement of the fluids uh, in the gut. Uh, conventional gut on models have uh, mostly relied on membranes, flat and stiff membranes. The problem with this is that these membranes uh, do not really recapitulate the, um, the structure of the um, extracellular matrix and um, they don't allow the, the incorporation of cells within the, within the substrate. As an alternative, uh, hydrogels um, have been uh, widely used as uh, cell, uh, cell substrates and scaffolds uh, since they are able to uh, provide uh, a biocompatible environment for the cells and they can be mechanically tunable. So, their uh, structural and mechanical properties can be tuned in order to approach the ones uh, in vivo. 
On top of that, the uh, microfabrication, there is new microfabrication uh, techniques that allow to um, obtain 3D structures that approach uh, uh, some uh, in vivo ones. Uh, for example, here I show uh, uh, the work of uh, uh, one of the people involved in my uh, in my group uh, at IBEC, where they were man they managed to obtain uh, really like scaffolds where intestinal epithelial cells could be cultured on top. So the aim of my project is to develop a bioprinted hydrogel-based uh, intestinal tube on chip with uh, integrated sensing capabilities. The main idea is to use uh, these uh, hydrogels uh, that will be perfusible and be able to be uh, under fluid flow and combine them with uh, intestinal cell culture. Uh, the main advantage of this is that on top of being able to uh, recreate uh, dynamic conditions, as I said, like peristalsis, uh, it can also uh, allow to uh, have a structure very close to the one of the intestinal lumen and incorporate other cellular compartments like stromal cells. Uh, to even increase to increase more the high, the throughput of uh, the chip, we also uh, uh, expect to integrate electrodes within this chip in order to uh, monitor what is called the transepithelial resistance uh, that I will explain later. The first part of the presentation will be focused on the 3D printing of uh, hydrogels. So for my project, I've been working with uh, bioprinting setup uh, based on a technique called stereolithographic 3D printing. The main idea of this technique is that a photosensitive um, solution is uh, loaded within a bat uh, that's placed inside the printer. And uh, layer by layer, the solution is uh, photopolymerized by a, by a light source uh, that has a specific pattern. Uh, in each layer, uh, the solution is uh, exposed to this light. And after several steps, uh, we can obtain a 3D structure. Um, in the case of uh, the solutions uh, I used, I I worked with a, a hybrid uh, blend uh, made of a synthetic polymer called PEGDA and a natural one that's called uh, uh, metacrylated uh, gelatin. The photo initiator that uh, I used and I enabled the, the photo reaction and also a photo absorber was added in order to modulate the response to the light. Um, the, the, in order to be able to print, uh, we need a CAD design that I uh, designed in such a way to obtain uh, a specific pattern uh, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the scaffold. After a few minutes, we obtain uh, this type of, of uh, structure depending obviously on the, on the, on the design that the, uh, that's uh, in the input. So as I said, um, I work with different designs um, and the, the first design I worked with was uh, a hydrogel channel uh, in which uh, uh, a pattern similar to uh, intestinal crypts was, uh, was uh, siding or was located at the sides of the channel. After several combinations of, uh, after several trials in which uh, different combinations of, uh, of, um, of um, parameters were used, we uh, reach, uh, well, we found out uh, the optimal ones in which uh, for uh, an exposure time of uh, five seconds and a layer thickness of 13 microns, we obtained uh, uh, pretty, good, uh, pretty good shapes and pretty good uh, structures. The second design uh, we also tested was uh, the, um, the, uh, the hydrogel channels in which uh, the sites in the sites uh, patterns that mimic the intestinal villi were, uh, were uh, printed. With the similar uh, par uh, printing parameters I mentioned before, we obtain also a very good, uh, a very good result and the dimensions of, uh, of the villi uh, were also uh, close to the ones uh, found in vivo. 
The second part of uh, my presentation uh, is about the fabrication of the chip and how I managed to encapsulate these hydrogels within a microfluidic uh, platform. So this uh, work uh, was mainly done uh, at uh, CNM, where we have uh, some um, uh, micro machine mi micro machining um, machines that uh, that allows us to work with uh, plastic substrates. So the chip was fabricated uh, uh, in order to have three channels. The main idea to uh, the main idea of having these three channels is to be uh, to facilitate to facilitate the exchange of media between. Uh, the different uh, cellular compartments, especially the ones that are inside the hydrogel that uh, will need uh, uh, to be uh, to, to receive the nutrients from this media, otherwise they will die. So we needed to uh, have this sort of configuration to make sure that uh, both uh, all the compartments, all the cells that will be put inside will be able to uh, survive for a long term experiment. On top of uh, what I mentioned about uh, the, the, the type of substrate we used. Uh, I also want to say that uh, to make sure that um, we didn't have any leakage, we used a very simple uh, configuration in which a, a, a silicon spacer was uh, uh, used as an intermediate layer in order to ensure that there wasn't any uh, leakage between uh, the different uh, parts of the, of the chip. Um, the encapsulation of the hydrogels had to be done, um, uh, let's say, uh, taking, taking into account uh, the nature of the, of the material since uh, hydrogels are very soft and they tend to, to deform when they are put under pressure like uh, many other type of, types of uh, soft materials. So in order to not uh, squeeze the, um, the hydrogel and lose these patterns due to the pressure, we had to also uh, adjust uh, the height and the height of the printed uh, hydrogels and also make sure that that was uh, fitting the, 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 the sizes of the, of the, of the chip. <clears throat> After uh, several trials in which uh, we have- Anil, you have uh, three minutes left. Okay. So after this, uh, we tried to make sure that uh, that was okay. And as you can see in the images, uh, more or less, uh, well, we can say that the, the achieved result, the achieved uh, patterns were uh, pretty close to what we wanted. So also a rapid qualitative test I made was to uh, test if the channel was perfusible, uh, since also uh, under pressure, the channel tended to be occluded. So, uh, this is um, what you can see on the right is just uh, an intensity profile in which we can see that the, the ink perfused well within the channel and that it diffused uh, on both sides of the, of the hydrogel. Another test uh, I also did uh, was to connect the chip uh, to a peristatic pump and check that there wasn't any leakage after uh, several days and uh, that went also well. and uh, uh, the only uh, inconvenience was the fact that some small bubbles formed, but they didn't really, uh, let's say, obstruct the, the flow. Um, the, we are planning to like do some small modifications uh, in this configuration. Finally, uh, I will be quick on this one. So the last part will be about the simulations and the design of the electrodes. So the measurement, uh, as I said, uh, transmitted electro electrical resistance it's a, it's a way to quantify the, the formation, well, to quantify the nature of, uh, of a cell barrier. And it's usually, um, it's usually measured in order to characterize the state of the barrier. Um, the thing is that um, when the, this resistance is measured, not all of the areas of the barrier contribute the same to the value. So the closer to the electrodes, the higher the contribution. To quantify this, we have a, a, a parameter called the electrical sensitivity. And the Sorry, you have one minute left. Okay. The optimal situation is to have uh, something constant and uniform. So I would uh, just say that uh, we tested different configurations in one in which there was an electrode inside and one where the electrodes were outside in the central channel. And we observed that for the first configuration, more or less, the sensitivity was homogeneous. 
but for the second one, there was a huge difference between the central area and the external areas, that, the ones that are closer to the sites. The, we quantified the error and the error was pretty important and the, the difference was pretty high. So uh, this was taken into account for next fabrication, the next step, which will be the fabrication of the electrodes. Um, so to finish, the next steps will be to uh, continue with the cultural cells uh, of uh, intestinal epithelial cells and uh, embedded cells, characterize the electrodes and monitor the formation of the barriers. So to conclude my presentation, um, I will say that the, the main achievements during this uh, year, during this, uh, well, these last months have been the uh, fabrication of a three-channel microfluidic uh, chip that's able to encapsulate upper fusible hydrogel, the, fabri the successful fabrication of uh, hydrogels that are uh, sided with uh, VLI and CRIP patterns, and uh, which approach the physiological range, and also uh, the, um, the characterization of, uh, of the electrode position and their effect on the measurements via simulations. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I would also like to um, uh, thank the European Commission for the funding of this uh, project. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. A uh, very interesting uh, presentation. So uh, it's up to the public. I invite you, if you have any questions, to turn on your camera and your microphone. I can't see any raised right hand. Hey, Fabiao has it. Yes. Okay, Fabiao, go ahead. Yes, yes. Hey, Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, maybe mostly due to the lack of time, uh, I would like to, to help uh, to. I would like your help to, for me to better understand the last part with the electrodes when you speak about the cell barrier monitoring. I could not understand uh, very well what, what are you trying to achieve or what, what is the, the, the objective of yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. I, went, I went a little bit fast uh, due to lack of time. Um, I know, so, I know. Um, well, the main goal of this was to determine the effect of the position of the electrodes on uh, the, ter the tier measurement. So, um, the thing is, uh, electrodes, the electrodes we are thinking to um, integrate within the chip are very small due to the sizes of the hydrogel, due to the constraints of the chip we have designed. So we cannot really make them, uh, we cannot put them whenever we want. So since we need to measure something that it's a barrier that covers all the channel, where, uh, which, is, which has the form of a tube, we need to have, uh, we need to uh, be able to, uh, make sure that the current, the electrical current, will go through this barrier. So the two main configurations we thought that could uh, eventually work uh, in order to measure this uh, tier value was uh, one in which the filament, a filament would be inside the channel and another one where the electrodes would be within the channel but outside the tube. So the electrical current would have to cross this uh, uh, the, the current will have to cross this barrier. The thing is, we don't really know, um, we didn't know how this would affect um, the measurements. And a good way that was uh, uh, already done in the past in my group was to uh, perform some sensitivity simulations. So sensitivity simulations, what they allow to do is that they, um, uh, they, um, let's say, give a quantification or um, a value uh, to uh, the total contribution to the tier value. So some areas will contribute more, some areas will contribute less. In general, when the closer to the electrode, they contribute more. When they are far away, they contribute less. Uh, under this uh, sensitivity analysis, we can like have a map of uh, the current density. That's uh, more or less what I showed here. Um, for a two electrode configuration. And um, for example, in this one, when we can see clearly that the, the, the areas that are very far away from uh, the, the, the center contribute more than the ones in the, in the, um, in the center, then that, what that means, it's uh, in terms of measurement that the error will be uh, much higher. Uh, 
So for example, in the second configuration, the error uh, goes beyond 100%, which is not, it means like basically you are not measuring any, you are measuring, your, your measurement doesn't have any, any value, let's say. On the, on the other hand, on the first configuration, the, the error is more manageable. It's like um, 50% 50, 50 for uh, low tier values. So yeah, it's, uh, I know it's uh, due to the constraints of time, I could have explained a little bit more, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no worries. But thank you very much for, for, the, for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other question for Daniel? Well, I have a question. Actually, it's really about like the next step and not thinking about what you are going to do next. Uh, it's about is you're going to use um, uh, epithelial cells, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, how are you going to uh, evaluate like actually this, this, uh, this, this matrix that you are performing to, to grow the cells and this hydrogel how are you going to evaluate like the 3D configuration of the cells? Like for example, like they are growing like not as mon monolayers of cells monolayers, you know, actually like 3D cells. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, the idea is to uh, focus this on, on like a, a two-step study. So the first step will be to culture these cells, let's say without the, um, Taking into account the, 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 the tier measurements, like for example, just uh, doing it without integrating the, the electrodes and then perform some biological uh, assays. Um, since this is, a, um, this is something we are starting now, um, the idea would be to uh, open this, the, the chip. And uh, since this uh, hydrogel is uh, printed on a substrate, it is to um, recover this substrate and then perform uh, uh, let's say uh, immunostainings or uh, life and death assays that can be uh, that can give you some information about how the the barrier formed um, within the chip. Um, so uh, this can be done with a confocal microscope or with uh, any other type of uh, instrument that uh, I have access to in the in the in IVEC, the other institute that I'm working with. So yeah, and then the second step would be to um, implement the electrodes in order to have like a, a let's say a supplementary or a complementary uh, readout of uh, how the barrier is forming uh, in, in, in via the, the quantification of the uh, transepithelial resistance. So yeah, it will be a combination of let's say biological assays and uh, bioelectrical measurements. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for your you. uh, presentation. So we move on, Jose, to the next one. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's, Let's see if they, I guess they are changing the... Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's move to the next talk. You can present her in the meantime. Okay, okay. Um, it's time to Jewel Xavier. Uh, she's from India and she completed her bachelor master dual degree in science with a major in chemistry at the Indian Institute of Science Education Research. Uh, she's doing her PhD at IGMAV and her research aims at the developing of novel uh, nanoparticle systems of various materials and morphologies for different applications such as photoredoc catalysis and biosensing devices. So you will, when you're ready, Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be presenting a part of my research work carried out under the guidance of Professor Francis Texedo in the LMI group titled 
architecting magnetic nanoparticles with metal carburanes to evolve new emergent properties. My name is Joel and Maria Savia, and today I'll be presenting or I'll be trying to explain how to modify and adapt the systems that you have to suit your purposes. Uh, which, uh, with regard to two different scenarios, one in photocatalysis, where the source of energy is light, and the other in developing a sensor. The systems that we would be dealing with today would involve metallocarburanes, mainly cobaltobis dicarbolide, abbreviated as cosane. Cosane is a monovalent ionic theta shaped metallocarburane having low charge density and 3D aromaticity the properties of which makes it attractive in applications of biomaterials as well as sensors. And the other component for this study would be magnetic nanoparticles, which are very versatile owing to their large surface to volume ratio, ease of surface modifications, size dependent magnetic and properties, ease of separation, which makes them interesting for applications in bioimaging and sensing. Since these two components are individually very desirous, we decided to integrate them together to form a component having the virtues of both. This was achieved by surface functionalization of the magnetic nanoparticle with amine groups because it was well established by our group as well as others that cosine interacts with the amine groups through a very strong non-covalent dihydrogen NH-BH bond. So the objective of my study would be to develop an intelligently responsive system incorporating the properties of metallocarburanes and magnetic, magnetic nanoparticles. So the first part involves photoredox catalysts. So in catalysis, the main challenge is the design of a catalyst, having high efficiency, selectivity, easily recoverable, at the same time being environment friendly and cost effective. We had demonstrated previously that cosane is a very good homogeneous catalysis, ha catalyst having high efficiency, selectivity, and environment friendly. But the drawback here was that it was very difficult, it, it was very difficult to recover cosane after the catalysis. On the other hand, magnetic nanoparticles have also been used as catalysts, but the problem there was that selectivity. So since these two components individually have their own properties, we decided to integrate them to form a heterogeneous catalyst by uh, surface functionalization. Hence, we formed silica-coated amine functionalized magnetic nanoparticles decorated with cosine. And these catalysts for, proved to be highly efficient, robust, and reusable. To explain briefly the design process, uh, silica-coated magnetic nanoparticles were in uh, which were already prepared by co-precipitation method as well as silica coating. They were, in, uh, they were administrated with the amino silane ligand in ethanol. The reaction was then exposed, uh, the reaction was then maintained at 50 degrees Celsius for five hours, following which it was purified by magnetic decantation. These particles were then redispersed in water to which the cosine was introduced. And then by ultrasonification for 30 minutes, the, uh, the as synthesized catalysts were obtained. This was then purified 10 times with water and then dried. Now, as we have the catalyst prepared, we went on to characterize them. As a proof of concept to show the interaction of cosine with amine, as well as to understand the amount of cosine anchored on the magnetic nanoparticle, we did a UV visible study. Cosine is known to have a characteristic uh, absorption peak at around 446 nanometer. And then when we added sequential amount of magnetic nanoparticle, which were functionalized with amine, we saw a gradual decrease in their absorption peak. This helped us in quantifying the amount of cosine angered onto the magnetic nanoparticle, which was around 0 0.028 millimole per 100 grams. These particles were also then characterized with zeta potential measurements, wherein we saw a change in polarity when they were functionalized with amine and when they were decorated with cosine from positive 13.7 millivolt to negative minus 15.2 millivolt. All these proved to be an evidence that the cosine is actually decorated on the magnetic nanoparticle. This was further catalyzed, this was further characterized by IR spectroscopy wherein we saw the VH vibration, VH vibration bond of 256 uh, centimeter inverse. 
The size of these particles were characterized by TEM analysis, wherein we saw that with increasing amount of cosine, with increasing amount of functionalization on the magnetic nanoparticle, there was a gradual increase on the size of the particles. The magnetic character of the particles were studied by squid measurements, where we had seen that even after the grafting of cosine onto the magnetic nanoparticle, the magnetization value remained the same. This showed that the magnetic character of the particle is intact. Now, since we have all this characterized and prepared, we went on to study the photocatalytic properties. The photocatalytic property of the synthesized catalyst was studied in alcohol oxidation. The heterocatalytic activity of the anchored metal carburene was studied for the oxidation of several alcohols in water with the oxidant Na2S2O8 by irradiating them with the UV, uh, of UV wavelength of 300 nanometer for about eight hours. A point to be noted here is that the amount of catalyst used in this reaction is very small, which means it is about 0.1 mol percent. The amount of catalyst in the reaction is very, very small in this case. Upon doing the experiments, we found that the catalyst is indeed very good. And we had a very high yield of almost 90 to 99% with a high turnover frequency and also with high selectivity. Control experiments in the presence of just the magnetic nanoparticles, which were amine functionalized, or in the absence of light or in the absence of uh, sonication, all these were performed, which showed a lower yield. And hence, we were able to prove our hypothesis of having synthesized a very, um, very efficient heterogeneous catalyst. The recyclability studies of these catalysts were also studied, wherein a number of wherein the number of cycles to which the catalyst can be reused were studied for the alcohols and it showed to be efficient with the same efficiency for almost 12 cycles. All these results, we were fortunate enough to have all these results published in the ACS Journal of Applied Materials and Interfaces recently. And hence, we were able to develop a heterogeneous catalyst with high efficiency and reusability. Now, as we have a system which is very good and we know that it works, we wanted to use the same system for studying the sensing in sensing applications. But as you would have seen in the theta potential measurement, as well as from the TEM images, these particles tend to aggregate. While this may be advantageous for catalysis because it helps in faster separation, in sensing application, this is a drawback. And moreover, when you have a lot of non-magnetic material on your magnetic particle, the magnetization value is also lowered. Hence, we adopted a new strategy to synthesize the magnetic nanoparticle by successive sonication and centrifugation, wherein we were able to synthesize magnetic nanoparticles without any other non-magnetic layer on the surface. They were very stable, as you would have seen, as you would see from the optical photographs, where we have less sedimentation even after 30 days. And here in this video, you would see that these particles. Yeah, these particles are also easily redispersible. In the video, you would see that the particles are being easily attracted by the magnet. And once you have it removed, they are easily redispersed by simply shaking them. Yes, if you just shake it, it's all back in the solution, which is also a very good advantage for sensing application. So now, since we have all this, we were, uh, since we know that the technique of sonication and centrifugation works, we wanted to optimize it by uh, doing the centrifugation duration for different time frames. When we did these experiments, we found that the magnetization value and the size of the particles that are formed saturates after a certain time, but the theta potential value remains the same for almost all the particles. So if I had sonicated it for five minutes, or if I had sonicated it for 60 minutes, I would have gotten a particle which is stable as the initial ones, so which is very good. But since we wanted to have a high magnetization value as well as a very good size, we chose 30 minutes of sonication to be the optimum time for sonication. Now, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Now, since all this is good, 
we further went on to functionalize these uh, ma magnetic nanoparticles with the silane ligands of APMS and APTS, which are two different amino ligands. As earlier mentioned, the amine group has a very strong non-covalent interaction with cosane. So we wanted to use this property here again. And we measured their zeta potential values. And as you would see, all were above plus or minus 30. So the standard uh, notion is that if you have a zeta potential value, which is between plus or minus 30, the particles will tend to aggregate. But if you have a value which is higher, the particles are quite stable in solution. All these particles were also characterized by IR spectroscopy. So all this work was carried out as part of an ongoing Euromission project, Cardia tool, where the final goal is to develop a device, a point of care device to detect the heart failure earlier by specific markers in the saliva. And as Laura has mentioned in her presentation yesterday, the biofunctionality of these particles is a very big challenge and the studies are in progress. So in conclusion, I would say that we were able to successfully graft a homogeneous catalyst onto a magnetic nanoparticle, which is non-covalently, to generate a heterogeneous catalyst, which is highly efficient and reusable. We are also able to synthesize and characterize stable my magnetic nanoparticles for pre-concentrating applications in sensors. But uh, for me, the take-home message from this presentation would be that we were able to demonstrate the need to adapt your system. So even if you have a very good system, which works in one case, you can tweak a bit, you can make it a bit slightly modifications so that it suits your purpose. So even if you have one, so in this case, if I had a magnetic nanoparticle, which was all well and all good, but it didn't work in another case. So I had to make few adjustments here and there so that it works. So it is also a way of, you know, doing science I feel so. And in future work, uh, in future work, we would study the compatibility of uh, magnetic nanoparticle with cosine as a preconcentrator by studying the interaction of different proteins with cosine, as well as we will study uh, to determine the effect of different amine ligands on the magnetic nanoparticle. And I would like to thank my professor, uh, Professor uh, Francis Texidor, as well as all the members of the LMI group and all our collaborators. I would also like to thank Doc Farm, your Marie Curie and European Union for their financial support for my PhD. And thank you for the attention and I now open to questions. An amazing presentation, you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now it's time for a question. Is there anyone that has a question, can activate the microphone or the camera. Is there anyone with... Well, okay, in the meantime, uh, you have questions there in the, hey, in the room? Jose? Yeah? Can you see the hands? Because Arturi has the hand and you... I don't know if you see it. No, I can't. That's why I was saying I okay, can't see so the hands. Okay, so Artur, <laughs> Artur, without your microphone that makes funny noises. <laughs> Is this okay now? I'm sorry. It's fine. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so, Joel, um, I'm, I'm totally not an expert on this field, but I was um, enjoying it and I'm also curious. You said that you would use um, your magnetic nanoparticles for sensors, right? Um, but can you tell us what is still missing to be to be to employ them in a final pro product or could you actually do it already uh, uh, could you repeat your question i was not able to hear it properly okay sure so you you said that you want to use your magnetic nanoparticles in in a sensor right yes yes um and can you just comment a little bit about what is still missing uh, for the magnetic nanoparticles to, to be implemented in the final product or are you already in the in, in the in this stage yeah okay so thank you for your question so what author had asked was what was missing in my magnetic nanoparticles to be used in sensing application so the thing or the thing that we still need to be studied is you know when we have different proteins in the system we want to see how it will interact with the proteins so in order to be able to make a characterization of it that is remaining as well as your functionalization with cosine so these magnetic nanoparticles which we are using in sensors 
also have to be functionalized with cosine, which will then again interact with the protein. So we have to study how cosine interacts with the protein, how the magnetic nanoparticle interacts with the proteins, and then finally incorporate into the device. And since this is a huge project with a lot of collaborators, the protein functionalization and their interaction parts are being studied by a collaborator in the University of Lyon in France. So I think by the end of one year, maybe we will have a device, a prototype. <laughs> Okay, nice. But but I see you will not run out of work anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. We have hey, a question oh. here in the room, but I have a question also, so I can ask. No? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You showed that in the first part that the particles were a bit aggregated, the first ones that you showed in the TM. Mm -hmm. And then you said that the, the second part, it, they were less aggregated, yes, yes. but you didn't show. So how, how, how is the difference between the first and the second? And also the size is different of the particles or? Okay, so. So these are the, for the second particles. If you see, they are more dispersed, yes. less aggregated compared to the previous ones. So in the first ones, when we had a lot of non-magnetic layers, especially with a lot of ligand, with the amine ligand and with the cosine layer, they tended to form a lot of organic layers. So that's why there was a lot of aggregation. But here, in this case, these particles don't have a silica layer. It's just with the okay. magnet, uh, amine groups and these are all protonated. So as a result, there is a lot of electrostatics also going in between. So they don't tend to aggregate so much. That's why we have a higher zeta potential value also as compared to the previous ones. And, and still you, you were able to see the cosine around the particles. Yes, yes. Okay, that sounds nice. Yes. It's been long since I don't see this kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there's anyone? Oh, okay, in the room. Uh, hi. Uh... It was very, very interesting indeed. Um, I just had a curiosity, the, the cobalt center, mm -hmm. what is the balance of that cobalt? Uh, the cobalt is uh, two plus or three, but so it gets oxidized all the two plus, three plus, it gets the okay. oxidation state, yes. Okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I was thinking on the, on the uh, when you are using it as catalyzer, mm -hmm. uh, if, if it is actually like at the end of the process, is it is it reduced? Uh, uh, or, no, so it's uh, a single electron transfer, but since we have an oxidant, which acts as a sacrificial oxidant in this case, it, we are able to recollect it back. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I have a question here, sorry. Regarding the, the stability, like the dispersion of the particles, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is the hydrodynamic, like, hydrodynamic size in a DLS size? So the DLS studies, when we did, we got a higher size than the TEM. So we got around 50 nanometer, which is higher because here we get only 11. But I we hypothesized that because we have an amine ligand, which is protonated. So there would be a water layer. As a result, we are thinking that's why the hydrodynamic layer is a bit bigger than the TEM. Yeah, so, that's, yes, like, that's that's that should be uh, usually what you will observe from the DLS. Yes, yes. But it's, I think it is also can give you the idea of how stability of the particles are, because like you cannot tell the stability in dispersion form by the TEM size because it's mm -hmm. an in dried form. Yeah, that is true. Yes, yeah, but, but then, uh, then if you compare like the one, the first one and the second one, maybe you get a different. DLS also like with the sonification mm -hmm. and sonification, you do you get a lower size in DLS compared to the first one? In the DLS, yes, that is true. We get a lower size in DLS compared to sonification, sonication method as the other method. But uh, because we have a zeta potential value, because we were more relying on the zeta potential values. So since we have a about the limit of plus or minus 30, we are thinking they won't aggregate. In general, they shouldn't aggregate in solution also. So, but like you said, that is a point which we can consider. Thank you. And also I'm still, I'm still confused about, you said you want a naked particle mm -hmm. because it's more stable. More stable, yes. And then you're still, we are still coating with silica yes. and then with then, No, no, no. The next one is not coated with silica. The next one is just directly functionalized with amine. 
So the first one, I have a magnetic nanoparticle, a silica layer, my amine layer, and then a cosine layer. But the second one, I have a magnetic oh, nanoparticle. Like no silica layers. There is no silica layer. Okay, and one more question. Sorry. <laughs> Like with the sensor thing, uh, you want to incorporate the magnetic particles in a POC device. Mm -hmm. So what is, the, what is your idea about what signals are you measuring from the so, material? Uh, since that part is not done by us, it's done by our collaborator, but still we are expecting for uh, electrochemical signals, if I'm not wrong. So finally, there is some other electronics which happens in the yeah, Because period. I'm curious about like, you. Because the magnetic particles, like, can it give like electro? No, so the magnetic particle here, the main purpose of them is so you have a lot of um, markers in if you, so the sample is from saliva and you have a lot of and proteins, everything in the saliva. So the magnetic particles here or selectively, uh, selectively grabbing like a pre concentrator in the sensor. So that is the purpose of magnetic nanoparticles. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, I have a one question from Oscar Moriones. Oscar, yeah. you want to ask the last question? Yeah, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you about the uh, set of potential measurements of the particle, but the ones that don't have the uh, silica coating. Mm -hmm. um, I have to question actually very quickly. Mm -hmm. One, what was the, the, the exit condition that you measured the set of potential? Because set of potential measurements can, can be in to artifactual. And also the second question is, do you uh, quantify the degree of amino uh, groups by other technique than the set of potential? Uh, okay, thank you for your question. So the questions were uh, the theta potential, the conditions for the theta potential measurement. Yeah. Since theta potential measurement is pH dependent, these measurements were clearly done in pH of seven, and it, this is in that range of six to seven, more or less. And mm -hmm. all the measurements and values shown here are from that. And in which solvent do you use? A water. 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 Okay. Yeah. So uh, the next question was, um, if uh, so, sorry, I forgot the next. If you, correct, if you quantify the degree of amino on amino groups on surface by other technique than set the potential. So the degree of amine functionalization, what we do is a very indirect technique. So since we know that cosine has a absorption value at a particular range in the UV visible, we have these amine functionalized magnetic nanoparticles. We introduce them to cosine. We see how much of cosine is attached. Since we know the amount of cosine attached, we roughly estimate the number of ligands that can be possibly there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move hey, on. Thank you very much, Ewell, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, it's the turn of Marta Kubovic. Uh, she's from Hungary. Um, she's, she completed her bachelor and master studies in chemical process engineering at Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Uh, she's doing her PhD at IGMAV, and her research is related with the use of supercritical CO2 technology as a fast and green methodology for the preparation of moth based composites for cutaneous drug delivery. PowerPoint. Jose, do you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay, so Marta, the, the floor is yours to start your presentation. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Marta Kubovic and I am working in the supercritical fluids and functional materials group in ICMAB. Um, my supervisors are Ana Lopez Periago and Concepcion Domingo. And the title of my thesis is preparation of composite nanoporous materials using supercritical CO2. 
first I would like to talk in general about what uh, I am doing and then later I would like to focus more on one of the uh, topics. So I am preparing porous materials using supercritical CO2. We are using this kind of high pressure reactors. Yeah. Uh, the pointer is not working. Uh, we are um, reaching usually 200 bars and uh, keeping uh, the temperature slow. And also we would like to um, keep our processes uh, green regarding also the conditions and also the uh, avoiding uh, the use of the half harmful solvents. Uh, I am working with two kinds of materials, the graphene oxide based composite iogels and the metal organic frameworks. After preparing the materials, we characterize them, uh, usually using solid state characterization techniques to understand their properties. And we usually search for collaborations uh, for applications to try our materials. I would like to mention three of them. The first is that I prepare a copper-based nanoparticle, graphene oxide aerogel, and we test it as a catalyst in a carbon dioxide hydrogenation reaction in the UAB and in uh, Iraq. The second one uh, is related to a patch, which is uh, composed of a metal organic framework, a polymer and a drug. And we study a drug release from this uh, patch in India Energy in Madrid. And the third one uh, is that I am preparing a titanium oxide-based graphene oxide aerogel, and we test it in a photocatalytic hydrogen production in Porto. I would like to talk more about the second one, which is related to the MOFs. So this patch that I showed uh, is based on a metal organic frameworks, which is in my case, the iron BTC. Uh, MOFs are crystalline porous materials with large surface area. They are composed of metal centers, which in our case is a trimers of iron octahedra, and the polytopic organic lingers, which in this case is the trimacic acid. And they form a hybrid super tetrahedra, which later assembles to a zeolitic architecture. And this architecture uh, has two kinds of mesopores of 25 and 29 amptions. And these pores can be accessible for uh, drugs. So a controlled uh, delivery of these drugs can be achieved from these pores. We use a supercritical CO2 in our processes. To reach these conditions, we need to um, elevate the pressure and the temperature of this media above the critical point. And in this area, the characteristics of both the liquids and the gases are unified. On the one hand, we have liquid-like density, which makes us able to solubilize different drugs. And on the other hand, it has high diffusivity, low viscosity, and no surface tension, which means that we can uh, remove the solvent more easily and dry the form gel. So the patch uh, that I showed is prepared in a three-step method using the CO2 in all of the steps. First, I uh, prepared the iron BTC uh, MOF, which has the structure that I have already shown. And then I impregnate it with a model drug, which uh, in my case is the azelaic acid. And we also do an impregnation from a liquid solution as a comparison. After that, I disperse this composite in a bi biocompatible polymer, which is the polyvinyl alcohol, and create these foam patches. And I also make another um, patch with a press molding tactic, which results in a more uh, compact uh, patch. And finally, uh, we study the drug release uh, from these patches in Madrid. So the first step of this preparation is uh, the preparation of the MOF. I start from an iron-3 precursor and a trimacic uh, acid. And after mixing them, there is an instantaneous precipitation. And I place this orange uh, jellyfied precipitate in the high pressure reactor and treat it with uh, the supercritical carbon dioxide, uh, which facilitates the drying of the gel in a controlled way. And we can eliminate uh, the, the dioxin that we use. Uh, after the depressurization, I got a dry powder, which is further washed with water and ethanol to obtain the final product. As you can see in the X-ray diffraction pattern, uh, we get a semi-amorphous um, uh, MOF, um, which is um, less crystalline as the MIL-100, which is a MOF uh, composed of the same precursors as, as the iron BTC. We do nitrogen adsorption desorption experiments to study the surface area. 
uh, we could reach uh, more than uh, 1200 square meter per uh, gram of uh, surface area which was slightly higher as in case of the MOF, which was prepared in the same way, but dried in the oven instead of the supercritical um, media. But if we compare the electron microscopy images, uh, you can see that in case of the supercritical samples, uh, we observed rounded shape, uh, small monodispersed uh, particles, while in case of the oven sample, this monodispersity cannot be observed. We have much more plain surfaces. Uh, after preparing this MOF, I uh, impregnated with the model drug, the azelaic acid, uh, using the high pressure uh, reactor and do the uh, impregnation from a liquid solution also as a comparison. To study the efficiency of the impregnation, I do again nitrogen adsorption uh, desorption experiment. And uh, what I could see is that the surface area of the composite is much lower as the surface area of the um, pristine MOF which means that there is no more accessible pores uh, for volume for the nitro nitrogen absorption. So the drugs fills completely the pores. And to quantify the amount of the azelaic acid, uh, which is loaded in the MOF, we did a uh, thermogravimetric ther analysis and the HPLC. And we could conclude that uh, with the supercritical method, we reached uh, twice as much loading as with uh, the water impregnation. This can be explained with that, that the, uh, if we impregnate uh, from water, uh, both the solvent and the solute, solute molecules are um, um, absorbed in the sorption site of the pores. And we, when we remove the liquid, an important amount of the azelaic acid is also removed. In the contrary, when we use a supercritical CO2, there is not a real competition between the azelaic acid and the CO2 due to the high diffusivity of uh, the CO2. And we can remove the media without um, removing that much amount of azelaic acid. And uh, in the next step, we prepare the composite patch. Uh, I am uh, mixing the polyvinyl alcohol, uh, the matrix of this patch with uh, the impregnated powder. There is a rapid swelling. And when I place it in the high pressure reactor and um, treat with the uh, CO2, which plasticizes more uh, the patch. Um, when I am uh, removing the CO2, there is um, a nucleation and a gas bubble formation in the patch, which results in uh, this kind of morphology with uh, pores of uh, five, around five micrometers. And I also prepared this plus molded patch with the more uh, compact structure. So finally, we uh, studied the drug re release from the uh, patches with two kinds of measurements. We use a, a diffusion chamber. This is just a scheme to explain these two measurements. We put the drug containing patch on a porcelain skin and we place it uh, in a PBS solution. The first measurement uh, studies the released drug uh, from the patches. We quantify the amount of the released azelaic acid with HPLC. And we express uh, the released amount of azelaic acid respect to the total amount of azelaic acid in the patch. As you can see in uh, all cases in the supercritical patch, the press molded patch, and also the uh, control patch, which contains only the azelaic acid and uh, the, the polymer, but not the MOF, we could reach um, progressive release. But in case of the control patch, um, the, the velocity of the release is faster. So it means that the half-life of this patch will be shorter. And compared to the commercialized uh, product, uh, we could reach a higher uh, drug release after one day. And the second measurement focuses uh, on the uh, quantification of the azelaic acid inside the patch. So this amount of azelaic acid, which was not able to reach the receptor compartment. We quantify again with HPLC the amount of the azelaic acid. And uh, if you compare the blue columns, you can see that um, in the case of the control patch, uh, we uh, have twice as much amount of uh, azelaic acid, which uh, retained in the patch, so was not able to reach the receptor compartment. 
So to conclude, I can say that uh, I use the three-step STCO2 method to prefer a MOF containing composite patch. Uh, we could reach enhanced jug loading of the MOF with the supercritical media compared to a conventional impregnation. Uh, we reach the controlled drug release of the azelaic acid from the patches and the diffuse and the retained drugs through the skin is within the range or better than the current formulations. And thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you very much, Marta, for your presentation. So uh, it's turned to the audience. Do you have any question? That is Fabiao. Okay, Fabiao, go ahead. Hey, hello, Marta, very nice uh, presentation. I really enjoy your your talk. I have uh, two questions. One is very simple. It, it was not so clear for me. I'm sorry if I miss it, but why is it acid? What is the function? Well, this is, this is just a model drug, but it is used to treat uh, skin diseases like acne, for example. But our aim was to use a drug which is soluble or um, with a co-solvent, which is it is soluble in the supercritical media. And like this, we can impregnate it. But we used it as a model drug, and it can be replaced with another drug which has the, um, a suitable size for the pores and which is soluble uh, in the supercritical media. Exactly. Okay, thank you. And uh, my, my other question is of course, it is key for this project the pores of your MOFs. However, these pores will be highly affected by the degree of crystallinity. And according to your results about X-ray diffraction, it doesn't sound or it doesn't seem that crystal. However, you are already having, in terms of releasing of the drug, better results than the conventional strategies like you show. So I really think there is a quite big step that you can still improve in terms of crystallinity. And sometimes this may be achieved. I don't know if you tried this because you only show that you tried 70 degrees two days. But maybe by changing temperature or changing time or even the metal precursor, because if, I'm, if I remember well, you use iron nitrate, but if you use another precursor like acetate, because the living group is different, it may, it may have a huge influence on the crystallinity. Do you have any comment or trials on this? Yeah, so um, with the supercritical method, the point is that uh, in this case, there is a fast precipitation because when we mix the iron three and the beet iron and the trimacic acid, it in instantly precipitates, which means that the crystallines, it will be not so uh, crystalline. So I also did um, more crystalline MOF starting from iron two, because in this case, um, it takes more time to precipitate the MOF because the iron two needs to oxidize in the, in the air to iron three, and it is precipitated slowly. Um, but in, in our case, uh, the point is that um, in case of the mil 100, which is the more crystalline uh, MOF, we have uh, bigger crystals also. And if we have bigger crystals, we couldn't reach such a big amount of uh, azelaic acid loading. And also we um, couldn't disperse it um, as mu uh, that much in the, in the polyvinyl alcohol patch. So if we had smaller nanoparticles, we, we could reach a better uh, disperse, dispersion of, of this MOF in the, in the patch. So in fact, in, in some applications, they use more crystalline MOFs. In, in some, they use less, and uh, both of them have some advantages. Perfect. It was clear for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, is there any more questions? We have a question the in the room. OK, nice. Okay, Marta, so just one question, like, can you do all the steps, like, in one step, like the MOF synthesis and then impregnation of the drug, mm -hmm. and maybe the patch, like, just in one step, put together and then... Yeah, it would be nice. I mean, that's one point why it's good that we can use the media for all the three steps, because uh, maybe some of the steps could be... Um, would be uh, unified together, but not in our uh, equipment because we use a uh, batch equipment. So the thing is that we need the, the supercritical CO2 to remove, for example, the, the co-solvent or the unreacted precursors. And later we need to add the azelaic acid, but if it would be solved to 
add directly the azelaic acid in a continuous way in the system, maybe it could be achieved, but not in our equipment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more question, I, I want to... A, it's just a silly question. Oh. But, hey, can you use the same foam to, char to charge again with drag? So, I mean, reuse the same or you need or it's a one use only thing? Yeah, I think, well, if it is in the patch, we didn't try to impregnate it one more time, but if it is in the powder and we release the azelaic acid, we need to activate again the dim off uh, in order to remove all the solvent molecules and then we can uh, impregnate again the drug. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Marta. Thank you. We move on to the next speaker, Jose. Yeah, we move uh, to the last uh, talk of the day. It's the turn of uh, Nidia Purilla Manivana. Uh, she's from India, where she, she completed her bachelor's in biomedical engineering. And then she moved to uh, the University of Miskolc in Hungary to complete her master in nanotechnology and polymer science. Uh, she's doing her PhD at Alba Synchrotron in collaboration with the UAB. And she's focused on the environmental chemistry and food science. And her research is related with the effects of selenium biofortification in wheat plants uh, using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So, Nidia Bria, uh, whenever you want. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself is Nidia. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. And uh, I am doing my final year of my PhD thesis under Lola Simonelli from Alba Cells and from Roberto Boado and Manon Valente from UAB. Uh, today I'm going to present a part of my thesis work, uh, cell biofortification of wheat plants in soils, in particular, um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy based on speciation studies. So the main background, why selenium? because selenium is an essential micronutrient for uh, basic uh, human metabolic activities, including the cardiovascular function, uh, thyroid gland functioning, brain activity, nephrological functioning, reproduction, and uh, a proper immune response. And we get selenium normally from the food we eat, and the food uh, gets selenium from the region where it is produced in general. Here, I show the map of the European region and the selenium distribution across the Europe agricultural land. As you can see, the concentration of selenium is very low, especially in the northern regions of the Europe. And thus, it hinders the recommended uh, selenium intake of 55 micrograms per day. However, there are commercial supplements available in uh, both in organic and organic species. They um, produce uh, toxicity effects if they are not in the certain selenium species or the recommended concentration. And plants have the natural ability to transform inorganic selenium species into more bioavailable organic selenium species like selenium methanin and methyl selenium cysteine and selenium cysteine, which can be easily incorporated into the human metabolism. Thus, selenium biofortification in plants is a best solution to overcome the selenium deficiency in the regions where selenium poor soils are present. However, for a proper biofortification, we have to think the different uh, pollution effects in the agricultural land and surrounding us. Thus, the interaction between cadmium, mercury, lead, and different pollutants with selenium in the soil interaction, their metal uptake, metabolic pathways, and concentration is very important. The main aim of my whole thesis work is to study the biofortification process and what are the species we get, whether they are beneficial or not, and how uh, to better the biofortification process among the different pollutants present. So this is a basic overview of one of the other studies which I did. In this one, I'm showing the hydroponic studies. Why we studied hydroponics is because it uh, gives us a better understanding of the mechanisms because the parameters are very much controlled. And also in future where vertical farming takes place, this can be easily uh, translated as well. In this work, I studied different uh, treatments of mixtures of selenium-6 and selenium-4 with and without cadmium. 
And wheat plant is the one is a major crop of my all the studies because it is also a secondary accumulator of selenium. And here uh, I show the production between uh, the different treatments within the cadmium, as we can clearly see the interaction between cadmium uh, is affecting the selenium treatment. And also I show um, small uh, distribution of uh, selenium distribution in the grain. This is half a grain uh, based on X-ray uh, imaging. Uh, this is the representative grain uh, in the case of mixture, which is more interesting to us. That's in the whole hydroponics with cadmium. We studied that the selenium uptake was reduced in the presence of cadmium. And also in the cadmium uh, treated samples, we also saw methyl selenium cysteine in the grains which are produced. Maybe this is good due to more stress uh, with accumulation of selenium and cadmium in the species. Moving on, uh, the basic experimental uh, steps with the current experiment are soil-based and foliar-based application. In soil-based application, we directly apply the selenium in the soil. And uh, why this is important, sorry, why this is important is because different species behave differently in the soil based upon the soil parameters like the pH, solubility, and the microbial distribution. And this can be easily converted into large scale production. However, we have to think the environmental effects of selenium accumulation in the soil. On the contrary, foliar application is uh, where we can use in both the types hydroponics and soils. And also this can reduce the overall plant stress because they are only applied in the surface of the leaves and not directly to the whole system. And uh, this can have less en environmental effects than the soil. Uh, and for the study, we, we applied selenium in both ways and we distributed into four different groups, the control group without any application and two individual species, one is selenite and the other one is selenite and the mixture of both. However, the selenium application was applied during the fluorescent stage of the plant growth. And uh, the fluorescent stage is where, when we start to have, this is called the flag leaf in the wheat cycle. In the soil application, we had it like 10 micromolar concentration. And equivalently, we calculated for the foliar, which is having a less um, large surface area, but less amount. So we have to increase the volume. So it was 50 microliters, mic micromolar concentration. However, to have the selenium to be easily absorbed in the plant and without losing, we have used a surfactant called as 320. It's a commercially available one. However, uh, we may, this does not interfere with the selenium applied. And also we had a control treatment group without any plants to, uh, for the better analysis of the results. Here I show the growth parameters, uh, majorly uh, based on the production. So the first one shows the total number of grains we produced and the total weight of the grains. And from the soil-based application, selenium-6 had better yield, whereas in the foliar-based application, selenium mixture had a better yield. In case of the weight, uh, as the selenium-4 um, treatment is present in the treatment in case of selenium-4 and selenium mixture, the grain weight decreases. On contrary, in the selenium-6 uh, uh, treatment is increasing in the treatment, the grain weight decreases. So uh, the selenium-4 and selenium-6 uh, behaves differently. And uh, the, we analyzed the soils, you know, the soils without any plants and the soiler and the foiler. The soils from, not from the top layer, but from the middle layer of the pot was collected for this purpose. And they were immediately, immediately freezed and lifelized for further applications. And here we studied the concentration using ICPMS and the speciation using the X-ray absorption spectroscopy at selenium KH. As you can see from the concentration, the control soils without plants have higher selenium than the uh, soil application with plants. And also the behavior of selenium-6 in the soil only and with the soil is different. It is very low and in this case, it's very high. But however, foliar does not show much differences because uh, the interaction with the soil is very less. And in the species distribution here, in the southern cage, we see uh, show the foliar samples, soil samples, and samples uh, without any plants, and the reference spectra. I only show a collected pool of references, which are more uh, identical to the samples which I have, 
as you can see, the first main feature is similar to the organic species methyl selenium cysteine and selenium, and selenium methanin. And in the presence of selenium-6 in the treatment, uh, we can see the peak of selenium-6 of the reference is similar to the samples. However, this cannot be seen in the foliar, maybe due to the less interaction. Selenium concentration in the plants, the plants which are harvested were lifelized and the, the weight was calculated and further were digested for the ICPMS studies where we can see the concentration of uh, the selenium increases with the increase in selenium-6 in the treatment of the soil application. And in case of foliar, they're almost similar in all the different uh, parts of the plant. The translocation is normally calculated by the ratio between the final component and the initial component, the parts we want to study. Here we always see um, three different regions from roots to the leaves and stems to the grains, which is the more interesting one for us. And as you can see from the roots to stem, in case of soil application, they increase with the increase in selenium-6. And this trend is inverse in case of foiler applications. Also in case of uh, from leaves to grains, selenium-4 have highest translocation. However, in plants physiology terms, when this translocation factor is higher than one, it, the metal translocation is better in plants. Thus, all the foliar application from roots to grains have better translocation than the soil ones. The speciation analysis in the grains of the samples, the pure grains were powdered and then they were made into pellets and they were studied at liquid nitrogen temperature. So the selenium KH of the spectra of the different samples are shown here. This is of the foiler and this is of the soil. And likewise, the selected reference pool is displayed here. The first feature of the peak mostly represents to the metal selenium cysteine and selenium methanin compound. Whereas the only in the case of uh, selenium mixture and selenium-6, we have sharp peak in the selenium-6. And this is more indicative in the soil samples than the foliar samples. From the spectra we obtained, we did a linear combination fitting analysis where we pulled all the different uh, reference pool from the one we, sorry, from the one we obtained. And we found uh, the weight components of the different species present in the grains. Thus the metal selenium cysteine is the most prominent one in both the cases of soil and foiler. And the uh, selenium cysteine is not present in the soil application, whereas it's present only in the foiler application. This may be due to the whole lifetime, the, so the selenium was having interaction with the plants. And uh, next, uh, selenium methanin is decreasing in soil application with the increase in selenium-6 in the treatment. However, it is more or less similar in case of foiler approach. And selenium-6 is present uh, as selenium-6 uh, applied in the treatment increases. Uh, selenium-4 we did not see. They were uh, uh, highly reduced. So into the other components in the plant system. And uh, this is the XRF imaging done at class beam line. And uh, here I show the selenium distribution in the grains. These are sections of 300 microns uh, done with vibratome sectioning. And the first one is the one of selenium distribution. And for easy analysis and to know where the different species are present, we divided the grain into major regions is the eye region and the filament strand and the outer layer, the bran and the middle endosperm region. Because in, in the grain, different, different regions have different uh, accumulation characteristics. And from that, uh, we, with the uh, selenium accumulation, we studied how the different species of selenium is distributed in them with a fitting analysis. And then we see metal selenium cysteine is mostly present in the endosperm region. And the selenium-6 is always seen as hotspots along the grains and selenium methanin is always seen in the eye and in the filament strand. Here I'm showing only representative of one grains, but normally it was also seen in the filament strand. And from the selenium uh, in the grains we obtained, we chose different points along the grains on the major regions we want to study. And then we took the microsaints. And here I show the microsaint spectra of the soil samples and the foliar samples. And they are grouped based on different regions along the grains. As you can see, the spectra is more or less similar to the one which we got from the bulk spectra. Uh, however, uh, there are 
minor differences between the regions and the, between the soil and foliar uh, respective to the treatments applied. And from the spectra we collected, we did a linear combination fitting analysis to see the component space distribution in the grains. And the, here you can see metal cell and cysteine is mostly seen in the bran, endosperm, and the filament region. And uh, whereas cell and methanin, which is also a major compound, is seen mostly, mainly in the filament and um, bran, uh, eye region. Uh, whereas the cell and six is only seen uh, in a very little amount in cell and six treatments, but distributed in all the regions. Uh, here I show the image of, this is also of selenium, uh, of uh, selenium six treated grain. Uh, this was done in diamond uh, with a very much finer beam of five micron. Uh, and we have the opportunity to study much with respect to different regions. So we chose brand region and eye region and um, uh, the results we obtained from the initial analysis were more or less uh, were all same as what we got from class. This we are in further studies. Thus, for the major conclusions, both the treatment method and application have effects on the biofortification of selenium in the plants. And in terms of concentration, selenium uh, six uh, have higher concentration in the soils. And the, in the case of foiler, all the treatments are more or less same in the concentration of the final biofortified food. And the selenium six have higher production in soils, whereas it was selenium four have better results in the foiler application. And in both the cases, selenium mixture uh, always tend to be in between uh, selenium four and selenium six. And we also, by the spatial imaging, we can visualize the major species like metal selenium cysteine is mainly in the endosperm region, and uh, selenium methanin is mainly in the eye and filament region of the grains. This is also good to know because during the processing of the wheat grains, these regions are mostly intact and they are not. Um, uh, thrown away during the making the wheat. Thus, uh, we found that uh, in the biofortification process, uh, we, we can obtain the major species uh, during both the treatments. And we have to optimize whether soil or foliar based on the treatment we apply. I would like to thank my supervisors and also my colleagues from the class beam line and uh, the D Department of Chemistry and a collaborator from Plants Physiology. And I would like to thank DocFam for providing the funding for the, the doctorate work. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Nigabria, for your presentation. Uh, is there anyone in the audience, like online or presential, that has a question about the presentation? I don't see hands. No, if but not, I, I, I can. Uh, I want to ask a curiosity. Uh, okay, then um, I ask. I wanted to ask you, um, how many plants do you have, and how many of them you really measure, and how do you choose them, and also if in one plant you measure, if you take different, for example, if you measure in the in the in one part or you choose different ones or how like how many you take uh, in in the soil experiments i totally had 96 plants so i had uh, nine plants per treatment uh, in, in the control we had less too and i was in because it's the first time we are doing in soil we don't know how it reacts so we wanted to see how each plant reacts to the treatment that's why we put one plant in the previous experiments hydroponics i was always having six plants per group and we had uh, totally 72 plants before. So with these plants, uh, I always pull them together. Uh, for the synchrotron measurements, we take an average of three plants from the same treatment and uh, the same wise for the ICP. And we divide them into roots, shoots, and grains. And the shoots, they have stems and leaves because the nodes can collect different selenium species than the leaves. So we differentiated uh, from the hydroponics, we know this, so we divided the shoots into leaves and stems in the soil applications. So now we have four different regions, but grains are the ones which are more representative, which we eat other than the mechanisms. So that's why I was showing grains and uh, the spectra. Thank you. 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 Th
Okay, that's that's so nice. It would be nice to visit someday and see how you grow them and everything. Yes, because it's I, really I finished interesting. growing, but now others are growing. So yes, yes, yes. It would be nice to see it live. <laughs> there is another question from Rosa. Yeah, yes. very very nice uh, talk and uh, just a question out of ignorance. I guess that the chemistry of soils is something really complicated. But is there any, or you have any hypothesis or speculation as to why uh, selenium-6 behaves differently in, in soils than, than, than when you put in the, in the I mean, foliar? Is it yes, uh, selenium-6 is highly soluble in soils than selenium-4, which is more soil, so soluble in water. And the uptake uh -huh. of selenium-6 in soil is better because it is less affected by the microbial uh, community. It can be reduced to selenium-4, which can be then further transformed in the plants. Whereas in selenium-4, they directly get attached to the microbial community much better than selenium-6. So they don't have the timeline to reduce in the soil for the uptake of the plants. Okay. Due to the solubility, it is better for the plants. That's why in hydroponics, it is better than selenium-4. In the foiler, when we apply in through water, the plants can transport them selenium-4 much better than selenium-6, as we can see here. So that's why in soil, selenium-6 is better and foliar selenium-4 is better. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. I have a question uh, about also like from the uptake of selenium. Uh, do you know uh, both uh, in the hydroponic and, the, um, and on soil like the pH, how the pH of the, the soil of the, of the water you're using affects the selenium uptake? Yes, in hydroponic study, the pH is normally given at uh, 6. Uh, the pH is buffered between 6 and 6.2. Uh, in case of soils, the acidic soils have better transpiration of selenium than the normal soils. And uh, the soils which agricultural is always between 6 and 7. And that's why we also used to mimic the same in case of hydroponics. And in the soils I used, I was also checking the pH with, between treatments before and after. They were always 15, be, between 5.5 to 6.5. Ah, okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? We have time for the last one. No questions, I think. No, no more questions? Okay. So... so. Thank you, so, Nidia Priya. I, I see this is very interesting and very different from what I've seen in the last year. So it's I, really nice, really. Thank Jose, thank you for being the chair of today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> so guys, see you tomorrow. Uh, we start earlier tomorrow. I think it was nine, no? Nine? <laughs> uh, 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 yes, we start with the welcome activity, the last one of the week. And at 9.30, we continue with the dog fan talks. We still have a lot of fellows. They are 22 in total. So, And that's it. And then in the afternoon, we have the poster session. Uh, some of you have been asking, can I change the time slot and so on? So don't worry. You can come uh, in the other time slot without any problem. This, the distribution is only tentative, just to not be all together in the same place. So if you can't in the one that you that I added you, don't worry, you can change, you don't have to ask and that's it. Actually, if there is not a lot of people around, you can stay longer if you want, you can come earlier if you want and see how is it going. We will be there controlling, so don't worry. And also to let you know that if you want to come in the morning to ICMA, the, we have this room for you. The, the, you can be 20 people. And also we have another room that I have it booked. Uh, they have a meeting in the morning, but uh, early in the morning, but later it will be free. So we can distribute you in the, in, at ICMA if you, because some of you are in Barcelona and it takes them long to come to ICMAP. So if you want to come in the morning, it's fine. Okay. So just if you need anything, I'm around and see you tomorrow. Ah, Naurin, you ah, no. I thought, I thought she had a question. Naurin, no. Um, yes, she has a question, I think, no? Yeah, my question is uh, so we first uh, connect by internet. And then if we want, we can go to the Sanadaktis, right? 
Hey, you can come to Sala de Act. Ah, you mean for the welcome for the wel activity? Welcome yes, activity. yes, the welcome like activity. Well, I mean, if you want to be in the room, you can. We can create one welcome activity room in the Sala de Actas because, okay. for example, I I am one of the of the persons in the room tomorrow, the organizers. So I can be in this room. And if you are here, we can do the activity in person. That's it. Okay. So if you prefer to be in this room, uh, you can be. But uh, for organization, it's better online. Okay. okay. But if Thank not, you. you can do it here. It's, there's no problem. And then after the welcome, the welcome activity, uh, you can be in, in this room without any problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naurin. Other questions? No, organization things, no. So see you tomorrow earlier. Let's hope to finish earlier also. 